How do we know that our houses are safe? Do government regulations provide a sufficient level of confidence? Or could they be providing us with a false sense of security? As I found out the hard way, we can't always take for granted that the houses we live in are safe as houses. Welcome to An Architecture, the built environment of a stateless society. My name's Tim, I'm an architect living in Boston. And I'm Joe, I'm Tim's brother, and I'm an engineer living in Adelaide, South Australia. And I'm lucky to be alive. So I moved out to Australia in 2008 with my wife, who's from Adelaide originally. When we first came out here, we were living at her parents' place while we looked for a place to buy for ourselves. So within a few months, we had found a place and moved in. At that time, the Aussie housing bubble hadn't popped, and in fact, it still hasn't popped yet as of the time of this recording. By the time we release this, I don't know. <laughs> so the house that we bought was a little ways out of the city in the Adelaide Hills. With no traffic, you could get into the city in about 25 or 30 minutes. With traffic, it was about 40 or 45 minutes. So it was a pretty good location. I mean, Adelaide's a pretty small town anyway, so it's not too hard to get around regardless of where you are. And so when we made the offer on the house... My father-in-law, who had decades of experience in the housing construction industry, offered us his advice, which was that the only two worries with this house are bushfires and snakes <laughs> coming from New Hampshire. These are not two concerns that I had ever had before when I was looking at a house, <laughs> looking for a place to live. <laughs> we were lucky enough not to have any bushfires up there. They did every now and then have a controlled burn-off. There was a big park not too far from us where they do control burn-offs every now and then. In fact, our next-door neighbors had lived there for about 20 years, and they told us that they'd only seen about two or three snakes the whole time they had been there. So, so your fears were allayed. <laughs> we survived that one. The house itself was not huge. It was a, a three-bedroom, one-bath house with sort of an open concept kitchen and living space in the middle. And it was a nice house. It was really kept up very well and everything, but it wasn't very big. And just the way that it was built and sort of the layout of the yard and everything would have been very difficult to expand on. We had actually looked into doing some expansions and actually done up some sort of rough sketches of how we could do it. The house itself was up on stilts, and we considered trying to put a first floor down underneath the main floor of the house. However, just the layout of the, the yard, it was, the whole thing was on a hill, so it would have been very hard to get equipment down there to do the work. In addition, our next-door neighbors on the other side, not the ones who had been there for 20 years, our other next-door neighbors had a house that was very similar to ours. And while we were there, they actually did put an extension on their house. We did find out how much they paid, and it was pretty expensive. And they were out of the house for six months while the work was happening. Mm -hmm. It just seemed like a huge hassle. So we kind of saw that whole process and decided that with that money that we could spend on that, we could probably get something maybe a little closer to the city or something that was already the size that we needed and in the sort of condition that we were looking for. And, of course, we didn't have that kind of money kicking around at the, in those days. Like you do now. <laughs> we didn't have that. <laughs> you hadn't started a profitable <laughs> podcast yet. That was before we launched the podcast and became instant millionaires. <laughs> but we did have chickens, rabbits, kookaburras, koalas, cockatoos. Uh, the neighbors next door had a rooster for a little while until I... I can't remember if the rooster was eaten by a fox or if it was, I think what happened was it was a neighbor had complained about it, like another neighbor had complained about this rooster and they had to get rid of it. But then I do know that the rest of their chickens were devoured by a fox. Yeah, <laughs> the, the daughter left the door to the chicken coop open one night or something and that was it. That's all it takes. <laughs> but anyways, it was, it was a really cool experience for me living up there because being kind of fresh off the boat into Australia to be dumped into this sort of Australian bush wildlife was pretty cool. Did you get like a big hat with alligator teeth on it and a big knife? And Since then I have I've spent years sourcing the my proper Aussie hat and I did find one, uh, which of course I bought at SeaWorld and the Gold Coast, so it's, you know it's authentic. <laughs> 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 I haven't got my croc teeth on it yet, but uh, it's pretty good. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, crocodile teeth, right? In Australia, yeah. Crocodiles, right? At any rate, we realized that we weren't going to be living in this house forever. And given the state of the market, or at least what I felt the state of the market was, which was that it was at the top of a bubble, and we had bought a place in the U.S. in 2005, I mean, we couldn't have hit the peak of the bubble over there any better than we did. And we, so we bought this house probably the most expensive we could have possibly bought it. 
And then, you know, a few years later, after everything went down, we were, we were underwater and all that stuff. So, so we didn't want to repeat that experience in Australia. Mm -hmm. So we decided to sell that house and rent for a little while just to wait out the market and see what happens. And it turns out that we were able to find places to rent that were either comparable to what we were paying on our mortgage or, or even saving us some money, especially once we factor in all the other costs that we had of that house, such as council rates and that sort of thing. Right, because your mortgage was pretty high over there, wasn't it? I think they're a lot higher than rates over here. At that time, they, they definitely were. <laughs> and again, we, uh, we were a bit unlucky. We locked in at like 8.65% for yeah. three years. And then, of course, you know, within six months, it was down to like, you know, under 7% or something like that. <laughs> so we were locked in on this high rate. At the moment, rates are actually are somewhere around 5%. Hmm. It's funny because you can actually, if you lock in for five years right now, the fixed rate that you can get right now is actually lower than the variable rate that you can get right now, which means that the banks are all expecting rates to keep going down. Hmm. There are a couple of reasons why the Australian housing bubble survived the whole crash in 2008 and why the U.S. didn't. One of the reasons is that the Australian Reserve Bank has a lot further that they can move down on interest rates. They're actually fairly hawkish on rates, definitely much more cautious on lowering rates than, say, the Bernanke or Yellen or any of those at the Fed in the U.S. Mm -hmm. But recently they have been just cutting the rates, so the rates are coming down at the moment. The other reason why the, why the bubble didn't pop was that as soon as this crisis or whatever it was happened, the government announced some programs to prop up the housing market, such as a first home buyer's grant, where if you were a new young home buyer or something like that, if it was your first home that you were buying, you could get, I can't remember how much it was, I, I want to say it was like 10000 bucks or something like that towards your house. So, of course, all these people started jumping into the market to try to grab this grant. Oh, good, so they saved the economy. <laughs> well, depends on who you ask. You know, people who have owned their houses for a long time or people who need to buy a house now, the prices are still absurdly expensive. I and mean, that's kind of the thing with markets is that there's two sides to every transaction, you know? <laughs> so mm -hmm. it's not like ever increasing house prices are the best thing for everyone. It's just they're good for some people. But, and honestly, they don't even really help people who are holding on to a house unless it's an investment house because if you sell a house, you've got to buy into the same market. Yeah, exactly. So it's not like you really gain from having the value of your house go up that much. So you get this sort of wealth effect that happens where people kind of see their value on paper and they feel richer, I guess. Right. Those were probably the two main factors. Some of the other timing was a bit different. The Australian economy works a little differently than the U.S. does, mainly because it's so heavily driven by the mining industry, and which is a very strong export industry. In crocodile wrestling. Well, and the Crocs, well, tourism, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, that's an export industry as well. All Australian manufacturing and all that stuff has just disappeared because, well, for one thing, there's labor unions have just like driven themselves out of the market. And another thing is just the fact that the cost of living here is so high that it's just not competitive to have people building things that they could be building in China or India or somewhere like that. So that's a bit of a, a long story on why I thought the market was due for a crash. It's funny because it actually, it actually hasn't crashed yet since then. So they were able to sort of kick the can, I guess, up into the air, and uh, it still hasn't quite come down yet. But it has certainly plateaued really since, I don't know, 2009 or whatever it was. It, it kind of dipped a little bit, came back up maybe 2010. So we actually sold this house in 2012. The market had bounced back a little bit at that point, so, so it wasn't a bad time to sell anyways. And so, like I said, rather than just jumping right in and buying another house because we thought the market was due for a fall, and I, again, I still think it is, <laughs> and so we, we've kind of been holding out since then, we decided to rent. One benefit of the real estate bubble is that there are plenty of investment properties on the market. I thought that as renters, we would be more able to negotiate prices and be in a stronger position to negotiate rents and that sort of thing. So we did have to find a house fairly quickly because we ended up selling the house a bit more quickly than we were expecting to. We used the same realtor who had sold us the house, and he had brought one woman through who just fell in love with the place, and she had already put bids on two other houses and was sort of like <laughs> looking to uh, make sure that she got the next one. So, so it really worked out well for us. That we just got you know the one bid from her, but it was a pretty good offer. So, hmm. um, so it all went really smoothly. We got pretty lucky with that one. Yeah. Yeah. 
we were in a little bit of a rush to find a house, but uh, we managed to find one that we thought was pretty good. It was in a good neighborhood. It was maybe five minutes away from my wife's parents' house. And in order to increase our chances of getting it, my wife and I both worked more or less in sales. So the two of us together sat down and wrote up like a cover letter. It was sort of a sales pitch telling this new landlord how great tenants we would be. <laughs> and it, I think we even included some sort of like payment history showing that we've always paid our mortgage on time and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> Go down to Kmart and get like the family photo taken. <laughs> we, didn't quite, we didn't quite go that far. <laughs> the other thing was that we had the chickens and the rabbit that we wanted to bring down there, which up in the hills, that's sort of a pretty normal thing for people to have that stuff. But this place was a bit closer to the city, really right in the middle of suburbia, you know. So we weren't quite sure if they would let us keep the chickens. <laughs> so anyways, it worked. We did get the place. You pulled one over on them, huh? <laughs> <laughs> and so like I said, this house was in a good neighborhood. There was a nice park with a little playground right up the road. There was another big park, which was sort of on the other side of a, a main street. And this neighborhood was on sort of a rise above the elevation of the main city. So there were certain areas where, like if we went to that playground, we could look down and you could actually kind of look over the city and kind of see all the way out to the ocean. Hmm. So it was, it was pretty nice, you know, nice area. The construction of the house was what I consider to be fairly typical for Adelaide, which is it was built in the 1950s. So it's a brick house with sort of a stone block facade and a corrugated steel roof. Houses here typically don't have basements, so coming from New Hampshire where every, every house has a pretty solid basement and you might have a furnace down there and all that kind of stuff, most of the houses here just have like concrete pile footings underneath them. Yeah, what's the climate like there? It's fairly moderate. I mean, it does get down to freezing at night sometimes in the winter, but it's not like the ground freezes or anything like that. That's why, in, like you said, in New England, you see basements a lot because you have to build a four-foot frost wall foundation just to get down below the frost line. So okay. once you're digging down that low, you might as well dig another you know, four, five, six feet and get yourself a basement. Whereas in, in the south, like down in Florida, they do basically what you just said there. The homes are typically just a, a slab on grade with a shallow foundation. And again, the, uh, the soil here is, for the most part, clay. Yeah. So that might be another factor. So you said the foundation is concrete piles? Yeah. So you so mean like vertical piers of concrete set down into the ground below the house? So they drill a hole down through the <clears> ground, <throat> I guess until they hit some sort of bedrock or something like that, and then fill that hole with concrete. And they'll do that in a few, depending how big the house is, I guess. You know, they'll do it in the corners of the house and then a few in the center of the house and that sort of thing. The reason to do that is... Probably, as you just said, if you have clay soil under there, the yeah. issue with clay is that when clay gets wet, it expands. And so through the different seasons, as the groundwater is rising or falling under the soil, that clay soil can expand and contract over time. So all of that movement underground can start to push and pull the house around. So these pile foundations, they can work a couple of ways. For one, they could drop down and hit bedrock, as you said, and then that becomes a foundation so that if the soils are moving around them, then they're still pretty securely fastened down to the bedrock. Yep. Or the other thing is if they're deep enough, then it just creates enough friction between those long piles and the soil itself so that any movement in the soils is resisted by the friction along the length of that whole pile foundation. Right. Another factor is that it's just a cheaper construction, obviously, than digging out a whole basement and building concrete slab and walls and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. And we'll post a couple of photos of the house on the show notes page as well, so you can have a look at that to see what I'm talking about. You can't really see the piles there, of course, but you can see you can see what the house itself looks like. Hmm. You can't quite see the city from there, though. It's not, it's not uh, that nice of a view from in front of the house anyways. And is that what you just described for the construction of the house? Is that pretty typical of Adelaide and Australia in general? Kind of just a, a you said it's one floor? But yeah, two-story houses are fairly rare here. For the most part, people will do a single-story house, and what they'll do is um, the blocks tend to be sort of standing on the street looking at the block. They tend to go back a long way, but the width is only slightly bigger than the width of the house. Mm. The side wall of our house might only be like three meters away from the side wall of our neighbor's house. Mm. You know, so you might have your house, then you got like a meter and a half and a fence, and then another meter and a half, and it's their house. They're packed in tight, but where they get the actual size of the house is they build further back on the lot. Hmm. And uh, one thing that is pretty common these days is people are expanding and they just keep kind of going back and back and back and taking up the whole lot just with the house. Huh, right. 
I've actually wondered whether that's some sort of a side effect of the whole housing bubble with the fact that land values are so high that people want to build a bigger house on it to sort of leverage, I guess, the value of the land somehow. I don't really know. Either that or they don't have to go out and buy and buy a bigger house into that market, you know, buy into those rising prices. Yeah. I think some of it is just, you know, people being stupid too and building houses that are way too big for what they need. <laughs> <laughs> that happens everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> The construction of the house, you said it's it's a slab on grade, uh, masonry walls, and you said a metal roof, or what's the roof structure? It's just masonry walls, like the main structural walls are, are red brick masonry, basically, but then, of course, everything is covered over with sheetrock, drywall, or plaster, or whatever, just like anywhere else, so. Yeah. There is also some timber framing in the house as well, especially up in the roof space, so typically, you'll have this kind of brick wall structure, and then... On top of that, you'll have timber uh, roof framing. Uh-huh. Then you've got your corrugated steel, which is screwed down or nailed down to the uh, timber roof framing. Right. Yeah, that's not too different from a lot of construction you might see like in the southern parts of the states. Yeah. I mean, it's cheap. You know, the roof's cheap compared to what you get up in the north where you've got to support snow on the roof and really be careful about getting leaks and that kind of stuff. Right. And the masonry walls tend to help in a warmer climate like Adelaide by just balancing out the difference in temperature from night to day so that they... They absorb heat during the day and they release it at night, basically. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And so this house layout, and and again, what's kind of typical for houses in Australia was that you would have three or four rooms in the front of the house, which were bedrooms and maybe like a, a formal lounge or something like that, maybe a dining room. A lot of the older houses would have the kitchen in like a lean-to out the back of the house. Uh-huh. So you have like a kitchen and a, I guess a toilet or an outhouse or something, which is actually like outside. Wasn't that what they have all through Australia? Don't you guys just go to the bathroom outside, like in the yard? Well, most pe- yeah, we do, but <laughs> my kid does. <laughs> <laughs> just be out in the front yard, you know, taking a leak around in the grass, <laughs> waving at everybody walking by. <laughs> trying to tell them they're getting a little too old for that it's not quite cute anymore <laughs> it's just getting creepy <laughs> well you just described historically that's again something that's kind of a response to the environment in warmer areas probably yeah in warmer areas where you have they separate the kitchen from the rest of the house because kitchens can tend to generate heat and in a warmer climate you want to keep that heat outside of the rest of the house You'll see that type of construction in historical buildings in warmer areas of the United States as well. Yeah, and of course, you know, nobody still has a an outside kitchen lean-to kind of thing like that anymore. Right. A big thing in Australia is they've got what they call an outdoor room, mm-hmm. which is where they either have maybe some sort of a an awning roof sort of thing, and they'll have a big fully functional kitchen out there. They might have a pizza oven and barbecue and refrigerators and bar and all that kind of stuff out there. Huh. And it's all done up kind of nice and modern and all that stuff. But I guess that's maybe a bit of a throwback to the old days. <laughs> that sounds nice. But, you know, the thing is, you know, people do this kind of stuff. And if you go out there and you try to sit out on a summer night in Australia, you will get devoured by mosquitoes and flies and everything else. Aren't <laughs> like, they screened like, in or something? Or, or are you saying it's literally just like... Yeah, a, I mean, some of them will be screened yeah. in, but I mean... You see some of these ones that are just, oh, yeah, we've got this outdoor room. We're going to hang out on summer evenings and sit outside and <laughs> sip some wine. It's like, no, you're not. You're going to be swatting flies the whole time. <laughs> so anyways, what happened since the 1950s is that in the back of these houses where the kitchens used to be, people have actually built an extension and put a real kitchen in there as well as a real bathroom and a bigger living area as well that overlooks the backyard. Mm-hmm. So this is a very common layout that you'll see at least around Adelaide, probably in a lot of other places in southeastern Australia as well. Mm. And so this is basically how this house was laid out as well. So you walk in the front door and you have the master bedroom on the right-hand side, uh, sort of a, we made it a sort of studio on the left-hand side. I think it probably used to be like a formal lounge, but we had it as sort of a den or an office, which we rarely ever used. And then keep walking up the hallway and on the right-hand side, we had the kids' bedroom And then past that, there's a sort of a sliding door which led into the kitchen. So there was a small dining area and then I guess what you call a galley kitchen on the left. Mm -hmm. And then the kitchen was partially open to this back living space, which was like a day room sort of space. And that was really our main, kind of our main living area in the house. So that whole kitchen and back living area, and there was a bathroom back there as well and a laundry. Based on the styling of the place, I'd say it was done late 70s, early 80s. Because it was a lot of like wood paneling and that kind of stuff. <laughs> like uh-huh. the ceiling was sort of wood panel ceiling and 
It just had that feel of kind of 80s. Yeah. So it, it was in reasonably nice shape. Some renovations had been done just before we moved in. There was some fresh paint on the walls. The kitchen had recently been redone. It was really kind of an Ikea kitchen. And actually, there were a few issues with it. There was one pantry door that couldn't open because it, it interfered with the sliding door that led into that main kitchen area. <laughs> hmm. So, I mean, it was pretty clear that the, the landlord had probably done it himself, but, <laughs> but it was functional. And the rent that we were paying was probably fairly cheap for that area. So we weren't really complaining too much about it. We were pretty happy with what we had. And so the yard of the house was, the front yard looked all right. There was a couple of nice cherry trees lining the street. There was some decent looking grass in the front yard. In the backyard, it was a little bit more run down. There had been an old shed there at some point that had been removed. And this new owner had replaced it with a really cheap, small shed from just from a hardware store or something like that. So that wasn't great. It would have been nice to have had a bigger shed because, again, if you don't have a basement, then really a shed is sort of the only storage you have. Hmm. There was sort of a um, garage car park area, which was, and again, this is pretty typical in Australia where you don't have a fully enclosed garage. You've basically got a garage roller door with a roof over it, but then there's no walls or anything like that. So you can walk through the garage door and then straight into the backyard for the most part. Mm -hmm. In the backyard, there was a decent grassy area and some bushes kind of around the back and the sides and everything. Of course, this shed that I mentioned. Part of the reason that the yard wasn't in great shape was that there were two big trees that had been cut down and the stumps were still there. Mm -hmm. They were sort of out in the back corner, so they didn't really get in the way or anything. And again, in the front yard, there was a spot, basically a big dead spot in the lawn <laughs> where there had obviously been some other kind of tree that had been chopped down. And with that one, I think they had actually ground out the stump. Mm -hmm. But there definitely had been a tree there because there were all these sprouts that would constantly come up. So this, this tree kept trying to mm -hmm. come back. And I've got a similar tree at our current house, same kind of thing, where wherever there's roots from this thing, there's all these little like shoots that come up from it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so basically we had this kind of bear patch on the front lawn. <laughs> And so we moved down in June of 2012. And of course, in Australia, June is essentially the dead of winter. Of course, we don't really have snow down here, but we do get a reasonable amount of rain in the wintertime. And especially up in the hills where we were living tends to be a lot rainier than anywhere else in Adelaide. <laughs> it happens to be on the backside of one of the higher hills in the area, which isn't that high by any other standards, but by Australian standards, it's reasonably high. So we moved down in the rain and it was just miserable and you know you're trying to keep your stuff from getting wet and you just we had to make three or four trips down over the weekend but we did manage to get it all down there and um and so of course we had to pack up the chicken hutch and all the chickens and the rabbit and all that stuff <laughs> and bring that stuff down we couldn't bring any koalas down with us but uh we, we do get them down here at the bottom of the hills every now and then as well while we were moving in, or maybe it was the next weekend, uh, we met the owner of the place. He came around to change the locks and to do a couple of odd jobs around the place, fix some windows and that sort of thing. And he was a pretty nice guy. I think it was Vietnamese or something. And um, he did like fly-in, fly-out work for mines. I think he worked in like fire protection systems. I don't know if he was doing service work or installation work or what. So, you know, he was reasonably handy and um, pretty easy to get along with. And so he had told us a little bit about why he bought the house and everything. And basically... His long-term plan was to actually demolish it and to subdivide the land to build a couple of different units or like, you know, maybe three or four sort of attached apartments or something like that. Did you do that on that lot, the way you're describing it? It's just like a narrow lot that... Yeah, but, but it does go back a little ways. And this is what everybody in Adelaide has done over the last like five years is they buy up some old beat-up house, tear it down, and then build a couple of different units and, and then either sell those as separate units or rent them out. And so that way they, they try to make more money off the land. And that's just happened all over Adelaide and I think probably all over Australia. It's another sort of race to the bottom type of thing because they don't put in the nicest units really. I mean, they put something that looks half decent, I guess, just good enough to get someone in. But it's part of this whole property bubble where houses are so expensive that people will actually pay money for these crappy little attached units on one yard that's been split up into four units and, you know, and, then, and the rest of the yard's like a driveway. <laughs> or something so, so there's like no yard is like four little crappy houses and another effect of that this is getting a little into the weeds but just on the the city infrastructure so you've got sewage and stuff sewage and power lines and all that kind of stuff which previously you might have gone to that lot you know the sewage is sized for one family but now you've got four families living in that same lot and if that happens kind of all the way up the street you know four or five houses up the street all of a sudden you've got like 20 more families on that one street 
pooing into the same size pipe. <laughs> and so There's less room to poo out of the yard, too. Yeah, and so for him, it was really just an investment property. And I think they had maybe one other property on the other side of town or something like that, or, or they lived kind of over in the, on the other side of town. And one thing that I think we picked up on when we rented the place from him, maybe when we signed the contract or something, was that he had the house in his wife's name, which I guess it's not a big deal. I imagine he was probably doing it to sort of minimize tax burden or something like that. If that's the case, then good on him. Yeah, that's the way to go. In Australia, you don't really do like married filing jointly when you do your taxes. It's uh-huh. like every individual files separately, even if you're married. Uh-huh. So what couples will do is if one spouse makes less money at their job than any investment or savings interest or anything like that will be allocated to their tax statement so that they get taxed at a lower rate on it. So anyways, we moved into this place and just started getting used to the neighborhood and everything. And like I said, it was a pretty good location for us because it was close to my wife's family and a bit closer for both of us to work. So we had shorter commutes and all that. So we just were kind of settling in. And then things took a turn for the worse. And so we came home one night from work and in the room across from our master bedroom, which was like this office study sort of room, and one of the cornices or a piece of crown molding, which basically hides the joint between the wall and the ceiling, had fallen down and smashed on the floor. So there's this big ugly gap up there between the wall and the ceiling. And the cornice adjacent to it, like on the next wall, had also sort of separated from the ceiling. It looked like it was hanging down a little bit. So considering that this place has just been freshly kind of renovated and everything, It's not really a good sign. (laughs) You'd think that they would have done a better job putting this thing up there. And so there was some sort of formal process that we could do where we, uh, there was some form we could fill out to request some sort of maintenance or whatever. And that actually went through, there was a property manager. So we rented the place through basically a real estate agent who was the property manager for the house. Even though the owner had came around and did a lot of the work himself, it was actually the property manager who was responsible for raising work orders and that sort of thing. And then she would send it to him, notify him, and he would either come and do it himself or, or get someone else to do it. So what was your first reaction when, when you saw this this crown molding sitting on the floor? And what did you think had happened? Like, why did you think that had fallen off? We basically just figured that it was something that they had done during the renovation, that they had just put up some cheap new crown moldings just to make it all look a bit cleaner, and that, that he hadn't used the right adhesive to stick this thing in place. Was it nailed up or was it just uh, was it just adhered to the... No, it was just stuck on with, I guess it was some sort of plaster or, or glue or something like that. I, I don't know exactly what he used. So. so they had a guy come out to fix it and, and I think he actually put some screws in it just to hold it back in place and he fixed the other one that was next to it as well. I believe he actually put screws in all of the other cornices in that room as well just to make sure that none of the other ones would, would have the same problem. Screw it and glue it. How expensive is it? It would have cost like 13 cents for a a screw or something like that. (laughs) Yeah, so they put the screws back up and kind of plastered it back up and made it look nice. So that was fine, and we made it through the winter. Um, The house didn't really have any central heating, so we had space heaters in our bedrooms and stuff, and there was a gas fireplace sort of heater on the wall in the sort of main living room area, that new addition that was out in the back of the house. Coming from New England, I'm used to winter and it being cold outside, but the thing is in Australia... They just don't build houses with all the insulation and double pane windows and all that sort of stuff. So even though it doesn't get quite as cold, you actually feel colder inside just because like the heating systems and insulation and all that stuff aren't as good as they are over there. Right. And with the masonry walls too, you know, they can, uh, you know, they tend to, it's like being in a basement, you tend to feel, the walls tend to feel colder. So yeah, that's right. The walls absorb the heat. (laughs) Right. So they were, you know, you're radiating heat into the cold walls. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so just to give you an idea of the uh, the trials of a mild Australian winter, <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah, where it might get down to freezing at night a couple times throughout the winter, you know. But I'm not quite taking pity on you yet. <laughs> the thing is, is that it, you do get a reasonable amount of rain unless you're in some sort of a drought or something like that. And, and again, like the ground is that clay stuff, so everything kind of gets muddy and and sticky, and it just gets difficult to like do things outside. It's just the ground's always wet, and you don't get quite as much sun. Granted, it's n- it's nothing like having six feet of snow or something like that. <laughs> but you know, it's not like it's not like you can go sledding or skiing or anything like that. You know, so the winters here can get a little bit uh, a little bit dreary at times. But you know, generally the sun comes out by the afternoon, and that's okay. <laughs> it feels like springtime. I mean, to me, winter here is what I consider spring. You know, <laughs> so right. So like, I don't complain too much. 
so we made it through the depths of winter and uh <laughs> it was a uh, spring t- springtime we had new new signs of life <laughs> more of those shoots coming up in the yard from those cut down trees so in september 2012 we had been there for about four months and one day my wife came home from shopping walks in the front door and all over the hallway in the front door is more chunks of plaster and so what had happened was along the entire left side of the main front hallway the whole cornice there had fallen down and smashed all over the floor. Sorry. Are these like, is it like a plaster, like a plaster? Yeah, it's like a plaster molding kind of thing. But it's big. I mean, it's not like some of the ones you'd get in the U.S. might be something like, I don't know, what are they, like three or four inches right. from top to bottom. Well, these ones are probably seven or eight inches. So it's a good heavy hunk of plaster, you know, that's up there. So it's smashed to the ground pretty hard and it's just pieces all over the place. We actually had like a, a hutch that was in that hallway just because we had no other place to put it. Plaster stuff smashed all on the top of that thing and smashed all over that as well. So so it was just a mess. But this one hadn't shown any like previous signs of fatigue or separation from the ceiling or walls or anything like that. So it was a little bit troubling that we basically had no warning signs that this thing was about to fall. And, you know, it's lucky that nobody was home when it did. Because that could have been pretty dangerous, you know. I mean, if you were standing under it, you know, it weighs a good amount. Yeah. Could have conked you on the head. You know, if my kid had been walking down the hallway or something, thing conks him on the head, <laughs> it could have caused some serious harm. So that wasn't good. And at the same time, there was a few other things that were happening in the house. So we started noticing there was some paint that was flaking off and some cracks opening up in the walls. That in itself isn't necessarily that much of a concern because it it is pretty typical for these old houses around here to develop cracks in a lot of the walls just because it's old masonry and it's in this sort of clay soil. So things move around a bit and uh, it is pretty common for these cracks to open up. Maybe every 10 years or so you've got some cracks that you need to patch up. Are the interior walls just like plaster or they use drywall or what do they use? Is it like just a crack between the corner where two walls meet or is it like a crack down the middle of a wall? Well, it's a bit of both. So a lot of times they'll start at like a corner or something, but then it might sort of spider web out to the middle of the wall a bit more. But some of the cracks that were opening up in this house were sort of more in the middle of some of the walls. That was a little bit strange too. So at that point we kind of said, well, this is obviously a more systemic problem that's going on here. So whatever they had done in that office, they must have done throughout the rest of the house. So we probably need to get this guy back in here and screw in every single one of these cornices in the whole house because obviously, you know, that's it seems to have worked in that other room and uh, it looks like it could be a problem elsewhere. And at the same time, in our kids' room, the cornices in that room were starting to separate from the ceiling a little bit so you could see there's basically a crack between the top of the cornice and the ceiling. These would open up and be maybe like, I don't know, quarter inch, half inch. We could tell it was definitely separated from the ceiling. Yeah. So it was just kind of stuck to the wall. And it might only be kind of on one end of it, you know, so it wasn't the whole thing necessarily. And so we got this guy to come back out and fix the one in the hallway and then go around the whole house and screw in all the other cornices. This was all happening maybe like the first week of September in 2012. However, from there, there were these cracks and some of these other problems that we were starting to notice in the house. (laughs) Yeah, at that point, I'm sure you were paying really paying attention to them. Well, yeah, because we had only been there for, what, four months. And so when you start seeing stuff like this happening in that short period of time, especially when, you know, it's just recently been renovated. Then you start to wonder, okay, well, why was it recently renovated? You know, why does everything have a fresh coat of paint on it? Has this guy just kind of plastered over everything and Literally. tried to hide everything? Yeah. Are there some other problems with this house that we don't know about yet? Right. As it would turn out, by the end of September in 2012, all these cracks kept getting worse and opening up wider. I mean, to the point where we would have a crack that was like three quarters of an inch wide in the middle of a wall you know like i could stick my hand in it you know (laughs) it it wasn't just like in one wall it was like these things were opening up like all over that front section of the house are these exterior walls no interior there may have been some sort of cracks and stuff that were in the exterior walls too but those are masonry they're probably going to resist that a bit more yeah I, i didn't really notice it that much these were all mainly around that central hallway so it was kind of in the middle of the house where all this was happening okay yeah Yeah, and so in addition to these cracks, in there was a big one in my kid's room and then another one in the hallway. Hmm. In the master bedroom, there was, I think I mentioned before, there was like this floor-to-ceiling wardrobe across this one whole kind of back wall of the room. This was on the wall that sort of shared the wall with the kid's bedroom. Even when we moved in, this wardrobe looked a little bit sort of out of square, (laughs) I guess is, is the way to describe it. If you looked at it, you couldn't really tell if sort of the 
wardrobe was leaning into the room a little bit or if the doorway itself was actually kind of crooked and leaning towards the uh, wardrobe. And I think I probably took a level to it once or twice to have a look at, try to figure out what, which was which. And I think it was a little bit of both. So on average, it's probably either which level. Is good. <laughs> yeah. So what happened was this wardrobe actually started noticeably leaning into the room even more. You know, you walk into the room and, and on the left of the door, there's a light switch. The wardrobe sort of on that wall. It got to the point where this thing was actually leaning on the light switch to the point where it looked like this light switch was basically the only thing that's holding it up. You know? <laughs> Yeah, I remember when this started happening and we were Skyping with you guys and you took us around the house and showed us, started showing us all these things. Yeah, this wardrobe, I mean, it looked like something out of a Dr. Seuss book or something. Yeah, that's exactly <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> Leaning down and, and just, yeah, just sitting right on the light switch, it looked like it could have just fallen at any moment. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that light switch, of course, is only at one end of it, you know, of course, this thing stretches the whole length of the room. God knows it was holding it up on the other side. It's a whole wall of a built-in closet or built-in kind of tall cabinets yeah. all along one wall of the room. And it's floor to ceiling. Right. So there's sort of head level closets that you can hang your clothes in and stuff. And then up top, there's storage space up there where you can put boxes and things. And again, that's something that's pretty common here in Australia as well to have these kind of built-in wardrobes. This thing was leaning against this light switch. And so, you know, I joke around and, and suggest that this is a, a structural light switch cover. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Made of the finest plastic. Yeah, that's finest right. structural plastic. <laughs> yeah. Made it made of the best 1970s plastic. And then the other thing that was holding it in place was this sort of strip of wood across the ceiling. I don't know. I, I think calling it like a one by four would be generous. It was probably like a half inch thick by two or three inches wide. And that kind of went across the whole top of this thing. And so what that did was it did kind of hold the top of it in place. What was happening was that the wardrobe was actually bowing out so that, like I said, there's kind of these two sections is sort of the doors down the bottom and then the, some other cabinets at the top. And at that kind of joint between those two sections, it was kind of bowed out. <laughs> so, huh. so like the top was kind of still in place, but this middle was coming out. It did eventually get to a point where the light switch cover just popped off. Now this thing's leaning against this exposed light switch. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> wires hanging out and stuff. So now you've got structural wires <laughs> holding this thing in place. <laughs> yeah. Let alone, like, if you go in and turn on the light, you've got exposed terminals there. <laughs> so mm -hmm. in Australia, you're at 240 volts AC, so it's a bit of a nastier shock <laughs> than you'd get in the U.S. <laughs> yeah. So this was a bit ominous, <laughs> to say the least. I think at that point was when we decided that we just had to get out of that bedroom and uh, move, move our stuff to a room that was a bit safer. So what we did was we actually moved our bed and dressers and stuff to that back room in the house, which was that sort of addition behind the kitchen. So that was like the main living area, as well as we took some of our clothes and put them on some like a portable clothes rack sort of thing and had our dressers and stuff out there as well. And of course, was your son still sleeping in his room or did you move him out too? We moved him out too because he's got all these cracks and these split cornices and stuff in his room. So we weren't going to let him sleep in there. And so, yeah, so basically starting in, <laughs> I've got the date here, the 24th of September, 2012, we were living in what was effectively a studio apartment, I guess, in the back of this house because we just wouldn't go into the front of the house. We, we just didn't trust it. It was just, to us, it just seemed too dangerous. But, but the back of the, oh, you think because the back of the house was a newer addition that it... The back of the house didn't really have problems. There was this one crack sort of in the what you call the dining room. So when you first come from that main hallway into the sort of kitchen dining room area, there was a crack that opened up along one of the walls there. But that looked to be more of an effect of what was happening in the front of the house rather than anything that was happening at the back of the house. So we were fairly confident that the back of the house was, was reasonably safe. Yeah, so we were sleeping in there. So it was just considering what we were paying for the house, we were paying for this like three-bedroom house and here we are living in what was effectively a studio apartment you know yeah with myself my wife and our kid all sleeping in the same bed of course the kid goes to bed you put him to bed you can't stay up and watch tv or anything because the tv's in the same room <laughs> like you know so you put the kid to bed and it's basically well okay because everyone's going to bed <laughs> you know like in the 1840s like reading by candlelight yeah that's pretty much the quality of life that we were having at that point <laughs> <laughs> so we took some of the other stuff out of that master bedroom and the kids room and we basically turned that front office area into a big storage room so we took all the stuff out of the bedrooms and just crammed everything into the front office area we, we actually started packing some stuff back into box. So we actually still had, there was some stuff that we hadn't unpacked yet from moving in. So we just left that stuff packed. 
and we started packing the other stuff back into boxes. I remember when you guys did that, and my wife and I were talking about it, I think after we, you know, after we got off the Skype call with you guys, and, and she's just saying, I would not be doing that. I would be, <laughs> I'd be you know, moving in a hotel room. Why are they still in that house? Yeah. <laughs> They're crazy. They got a kid. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Well, so I'll get to our, I guess, our rationalizations for all that. You know, the thoughts did cross our mind that, you know, we just need to get out of this house. I mean, we could have gone down to my wife's parents' house, too, which was just not far away, maybe five minutes down the road. We did have this rental contract and we're paying rent. And to date, the owner had been pretty good about addressing problems in the house. In the four months that we were there, we had had enough experience with problems in the house that uh, we, we knew that the owner was fairly responsive to those. So to add insult to injury, there's a big problem in Australia of possums, which are like, not, they're not the same thing as opossums that you have in the U.S. They're, it's the Australian equivalent of a squirrel, basically, but it's a bit bigger and it's basically a large marsupial rat is probably the best way to describe it. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I guess if they're in certain contexts, you know, if you, if you see one in a tree or something, it might be a little bit cute or something, but they are pretty significant pests. If you've got fruit trees, they'll eat all the fruit off your tree. And what happens is just like squirrels do, you know, they'll come into your house and make nests in your roof space or in your walls or whatever. And uh, as luck would have it, while we're living in this back uh, room, some possums decide to move in with us. <laughs> so they're basically... Into the walls. Uh, well, yeah, into the walls of the house. So you'd be sitting there trying to go to sleep at night, and all of a sudden there's a possum fight in the wall right behind your head. <laughs> and now, now the thing about possums is, like, you think about squirrels. Like, squirrels, they can be pests, but when they run around, like, they're pretty light on their feet. Well, possums mm-hmm. are disproportionately heavy on their feet for their size. I don't know how they manage to make as much noise as they do. They'll go and run across your roof and it's just like, I mean, it sounds like thunder (laughs) on your roof or something, you know? I mean, these things, I don't know how they do it, but yeah, they would have these fights in the walls. The thing about marsupials, which is pretty much most native mammals in Australia are marsupials, which of course means they have the baby in the pouch and all that stuff. And for the most part, marsupials are kind of cute and, you know, koalas and kangaroos and bandicoots and things like that you know <laughs> and uh bilbies and all this so you know for, for any kind of animal that you've got like in the u.s you've got sort of a marsupial equivalent of that in australia you know you can say oh, that's kind of like a that's kind of like a squirrel that's kind of like a rabbit like a bilby is sort of like an, a marsupial rabbit it's got these long ears and stuff so at easter we have easter bilbies <laughs> so the thing about marsupials is that they're cute but man the noises they make are just blood curdling so like koalas, when we were up in the hills, we had those koalas up in the trees up there. And, you know, the, the male koalas just make this like grunting sound that's just like horrible. It's just like, like, how does that much sound come out of that little cuddly thing up there? Of course, if it's mating seasons, then you get all kinds of extra sounds that are just beyond the pale. <laughs> and possums are no exception. So, so these possums are in the walls. They start fighting and man, they just start like hissing and shrieking and just making the biggest racket. And again, they're just thumping on the walls and everything. This is happening. It's like literally like right behind your head, lying in your bed, you got your headboard right behind that. You got like what a three, a half inch of sheetrock. And then there's a possum fight happening right there. (laughs) My wife had an apartment like that where of course it wasn't possums. It was squirrels, but they were up in this, like the third floor of this building kind of in the gable roof area. And they had the same thing. Squirrels up in the, up in the roof area. Yeah. (laughs) And you'd, you know, you'd be in there at night, you hear the, you hear the squirrels going scurrying up through the roof. Yeah. And then one day she comes out, you know, she's going to leave the apartment to go to work or whatever. She opens the door to her apartment down to the stairway and there's a squirrel sitting there <laughs> staring at her from the top landing. <laughs> so she, you know, of course she pauses for a moment. She's thinking she's going to like close the door and like, you know, run away. But she's like, wait a minute, it's just a squirrel. I can chase it away. <laughs> yeah. She starts like kind of making some noise and chasing it down the stairs. The squirrel starts running down the stairs. Yeah. Gets down to the next landing. There's another squirrel <laughs> facing that squirrel. That squirrel turns around, starts chasing her back into the apartment. <laughs> so she runs back up into the apartment. The squirrel go, comes into the apartment with her, goes all the way through the apartment. <laughs> he opens the back door. The squirrel goes out the back door down the fire escape. <laughs> it's like Christmas vacation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <Literally>. <laughs> this is actually, I think, the second time that we had had possums in the house. So previously we had had them in there. And the, again, this is one of those things where we thought the owner was fairly responsive where he had come and got the possums removed. Now, one thing in our um, in our rental contract was it delineates who's responsible for different sorts of pests in the house. So I think if there's like mice, 
then the tenant's responsible. But if it's, I think it's explicitly spelled out if there's possums, then it's the owner that's responsible. Huh. So he had come and previously had some sort of animal specialist come in and remove the possums, but apparently they found another way in. <laughs> yeah. I think he came and, and had the possums removed. And at the same time, of course, so we're living in the back of the house now. And I think after that second cornice fell and we started noticing these other cracks and things, we had put in some of these maintenance request forms and all this and asked the owner to have a closer look at this and try to figure out what was going on here and try to fix the house. At that point, did you have an idea of what the problem was or had you I mean, not to look into it any deeper? We hadn't really put too much thought into it. We thought, okay, maybe there was some problem with the footings or something like that, you know, with this old house. And All right, so you thought there could be some real kind of structural problem at that point. Yeah, well, obviously there was. <laughs> it's just a matter of, of what right, was... But just not knowing what was causing it. Yeah, what was the root cause, right? Yeah. At this point, when we started asking him to look more closely into the problems in this house... I can't remember how it came about, but we found out that he had actually, prior to the time that we moved in, he had actually had a guy come out and do some sort of reinforcement to the footings. Huh. So he, I don't know what he had done, come out and, and poured a bit more concrete down the holes or something like that, maybe drilled some new holes. Or, I don't know exactly what the process is there, but it's a process that they call underpinning. Yeah, underpinning basically just means kind of shoring up the foundation or possibly you could get in there and, and make it bigger or do some other modifications to it that hopefully will will strengthen it. A lot of times that's done if you're building a new building next to an older building, you have to excavate next to an existing foundation wall. Yeah, so I don't know exactly what they did, but I would imagine they dug out some additional holes around the existing concrete piles and poured some more concrete down there or something like that just to give it a bit more mass and a bit more structure. Yeah, they could have poured a uh, maybe a wider footing kind of around the whole, the whole house, you know, the whole base of the foundation. Yeah, but the whole foundation of this house is just, it's just poles. It's just concrete Oh, piles. there's no continuous, there's like no continuous nah. piece of concrete around the perimeter? No. Nah. That's not how they do it. Oh, oh, so the corners are literally <laughs> just sitting, oh, I don't understand that. So the corners are literally just sitting on piles. vertical yeah. poles. It's like a... It's like a house on stilts, <laughs> like we had up right, in the it's hills. Like a house on, it's <laughs> like a house on stilts just sitting, um, Except the stilts sitting in the ground. <laughs> yeah, the stilts are made of concrete and they're buried in the ground. Right. <laughs> so, right but right. yeah, that's how they do it here. Yeah, because sometimes even with piles, sometimes you'll have a footing that's like a continuous footing and has piles underneath it. That's yeah. what I was picturing. I think that more modern houses have will actually have like a slab that's poured, which is maybe they've got piles under that to kind of anchor everything, but then they've got a slab and then they build on top of the slab. What was the floor slab in this house? I mean, what was the floor? Was it? The floor was just wood, you know, like like a oh. polished wood. So was there, so was there <laughs> like a crawl space under the house? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that, that's typically oh, okay. what there is. Right. Yeah, there's right. basically some sort of a crawl space under the house. You can't really get it. Like, it's not enough. It's not big enough to get under and really do anything uh -huh. under there. But And so what they do to, to do this underpinning stuff, they actually, you can see where they've actually cut out a chunk of the floor, like a section of the floor, so that they could get to where this footing was, uh, you know, to, to wherever the pile was. And um, I guess pour some bags of concrete down there or whatever they do. Right. And actually, you know, having kind of known that that had happened, you, you could see in the house where there's other areas where they've done that. And actually in the house we're in now, you can see there's a couple areas where there's, there's been holes that have been cut in the floor as well. I don't think that's an uncommon thing for a house to be underpinned like that. You know, especially, like I said, these old houses, um, especially, especially where... the way it's built, but there's no... Yeah. I mean, the thing is when you get some kind of a continuous foundation that even if there is some movement in, let's say, at one of those piles, then the rest of the thing remains rigid so that, right. yeah, there may be that maybe the whole house moves as a unit, but it's not moving. You don't have the piles moving differentially to each other. Yeah. Well, it was pretty clear that we did have piles moving different. Well, I don't know. I really don't know. I mean, at, at this point, we didn't know. But they had thought that that might be a problem, so they came out and had done some, yeah. some foundation work to try to make this thing a little bit more solid. Yeah. So, of course, this opens up a whole new mystery, which is, okay, well, what was the condition of this house before we moved in, before this guy did any renovations and stuff? So, clearly, there had been some sort of problem before that he had known about, and he had tried to address by doing this underpinning or whatever. So, that was interesting. However, you know, the fact that he did do the underpinning showed that, okay, well, at least he's trying to fix it. He's trying to do the right thing. And he did have this guy come out. And I can't remember if they did any additional underpinning while we were there or if he was, just, I think he just got the guy out to sort of have another look at it. And from memory, he got a couple of different contractors out because he didn't really like what the first guy said. And then he got some other guy to come out and 
At this point, we were starting to lose faith a little bit in whether or not he was actually going to be able to fix this thing. He was just kind of giving us the runaround with bringing different contractors to the house and all this stuff. Trying to get the contra- one contractor to tell him what he wanted to hear, right? Which is that he didn't have to do anything. That's, I mean, that's kind of what it seemed like, right? And of course, the guy who had come out and done this original underpinning had come out and said, now, look, there's a lot of concrete under that house. Like, it's not the footings. Like, they're, they're not what's causing the problem, you know? Huh. And so he got up into the roof space and had a look at the... Maybe all that concrete was sinking. <laughs> well, yeah, that, who knows? That could have been the problem too. Yeah, too much weight now in the soil. Well, this underpinner guy thought the problem was he had gotten up into the roof space and had a look at some of the structure up there, some of the framing and all that. And what he had said was the sort of front wall of the house, you know, so, so the exterior front wall of the house was leaning out, tipping forward. The whole front of the house was kind of shearing forward you know it's so like the, the wall the walls were starting to lean like the you know ceilings might have been remaining level but you know so turning from sort of a square into a parallelogram thing a rhombus, a rhombus. <laughs> we had a rhomboid house <laughs> and what he was saying was that you can fix it if you just put a bit of additional framing up in that roof space he had the whole plan where he was gonna rig something up to sort of pull it back into shape and then put some additional framing up there to give it more structure at the top of the house. Yeah, it's again, I guess that whole concept of just trying to make the whole house more rigid so that yeah. any movement at the individual foundations are resisted by the rigidity of the whole house. Yeah, that's right. So this seemed like a reasonable solution because in the scheme of things, it was probably fairly low cost and seemed like it would do the job or at least hold things in place for a little bit longer. <laughs> mm-hmm. So there was a bit of back and forth between this contractor and the owner. At one point, the owner came to the house Basically, his his response was, oh, I just want to monitor the situation and see how it goes. The landlord? That's what the landlord said? It was the landlord, yeah, the the owner, yeah. <laughs> and then the other thing he says is, uh, he looks at the wardrobe and says, no, I don't think that's a problem. <laughs> this, is the, this is the thing that's like, you know, hanging off the wall. I had a ladder in that room just to catch it in case it fell so it wouldn't smash Jeez. down to the floor, you know? <laughs> 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 yeah, oh yeah, no, I, I don't think that's a problem. I'm just going to monitor the situation. <laughs> yeah. So at this point, we decided, Jeez. I mean, this is a game changer mm-hmm. because really up until this point, our attitude was, yeah, this sucks. We're living in this one room with the possums or whatever, but it seems like this guy is trying to do the right thing. So we're trying to accommodate it and understanding that some of these things can take a bit of time. Mm-hmm. And it really, and this had only been, so we moved to the back of the house on the 24th of September. And now this was around the 5th or 6th of October. (laughs) Right. You know, so, I mean, this is only like not even two weeks, I don't think. Right. About two weeks. In the scheme of things, he was trying to resolve this. Well, up to a point, he was trying to resolve the situation. He was getting these different contractors in. Uh But he just didn't like what he was hearing, I guess, and had probably sunk enough money into it already. He didn't want to sink anymore because he knew that after a few years, he was planning to tear this house down anyways to build some condos or whatever it was, Uh units that he was going to build. So he just didn't want to sink any more money into it. Right. But I mean, it's one thing to like, you get a cold and you say, oh, I'm just going to monitor it and see if I feel better. You know, it's like <laughs> right. your, your body has a natural mechanism for dealing with that. Right. You know, like that house wasn't going to get any better. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> <all right. laughs> like gravity was not our friend, you know. <laughs> so it's just unbelievable that he came up with that so yeah i wonder what was the piece of evidence that he was waiting for that would have changed his mind like yeah i don't know i mean i don't know if he was hoping to get some other contractors in there that would tell him something else that he wanted to hear or whatever (laughs) but i don't know i mean it seemed to me like this plan to just put a bit more timber up in the roof space seemed like a no-brainer to me like i can't imagine that would have been more than like 500 bucks worth of work you know right to save the whole house Uh uh-huh uh-huh you know, to make the house habitable. Right. So at that point, we decided that enough was enough, and uh, we, we realized that the situation wasn't going to get any better just by waiting around. So once this structural engineer came up with a solution to put some bracing up in the roof, we filed a Form 4 request. The Form 4 was sort of the formal request for maintenance that we filed with the property manager. It was the 7th of October that we filed that Form 4 request, and that form allowed for something like two weeks that he had to resolve the problem. I don't remember exactly how long it was, but since he had told us essentially that he wasn't going to fix it, as soon as he told us that, the next day, which was the 8th of October, so the day after we filed this request for repairs, Uh he tells us he's not going to fix it. The next day, we sent him a, a formal letter of termination of the lease due to breach. Right. And we gave him five weeks notice. Well, it's pretty generous. <laughs> well, I mean, that, that's what the contract called for. You know, I okay. mean, it, it was 
ridiculous, but yeah. we were just trying to do everything by the book here pretty much. You know, we wanted to, we didn't want to get stuck in a position where if it came down to it, he was going to be able to say, well, you guys breached the contract because you stopped paying rent or something like that. Right. Yeah. You know? Yeah. We figured that if it came down to it, we would be able to get some of that rent back. We didn't really know what to do. All we knew was like, okay, it's time to get out. Right. You know? So <laughs> we gave him this five weeks notice. What did the letter say? How did you approach that with him? I'll just read some of the letter here just so you can kind of get a feel for what it was. And so I, I guess the idea was that we were trying to be sort of professional and we, we didn't want to come off sounding like someone you'd see on Judge Judy or something like that. You know, so, so we're trying to sound reasonable and professional and all that stuff, you know, so. Mm-hmm. So we addressed it to the property manager and we said, we are writing to request a termination of our fixed term residential tenancy agreement effective Monday, the 12th of November in 2012, which was five weeks notice. Mm-hmm. Following our previous correspondence on the 24th of September regarding the structural safety of the house, the engineer visited the premises on Wednesday the 26th, Sunday the 30th, and Thursday the 4th of October. Frank, the guy's name was Frank, Frank has provided a repair quote to the landlord to repair some walls and install bracing in the roof for structural stability. The engineer also advised the landlord that the wardrobe needed to be bolted to the wall for safety reasons or alternatively removed and replaced as the adjacent connecting wall needs to be removed. (laughs) (laughs) Another thing I forgot to mention here, in the top of this wardrobe, it was just kind of open to the wall behind it. And so you could see brick wall behind it. Uh And at one point I looked up in there and there was actually like chunks of brick that had exploded out of the wall or or something like, like, (laughs) so there was some sort of forces in there that were causing the bricks to actually like crumble and shoot out into the, into the wardrobe. (laughs) Obviously there was some huge stresses happening back Mm -hmm. there. Yeah. And so, uh, where was I? (laughs) This wardrobe is visibly leaning in towards the center of the room and it is not bolted to the wall. It is only secured in place by a strip of wood attached to the ceiling. The light switch cover on the entry door frame. Remember our friend, the, our light switch cover. Uh-huh. The light switch cover on the entry door frame has detached from the wall since the wardrobe's motion has pushed it out of place. <laughs> Talk about being let's diplomatic. Put, huh? Let's put it in delicately. Yeah. <laughs> it has fallen off the wall, leaving the wiring and terminal screws exposed. We're trying to highlight not just the the structural safety issues, but now we've got a, like an electrical hazard here because of this thing as well, right? Right. The landlord has advised us that he intends only to monitor the movement of the house and replace the damaged cornices. In addition to this, he has opted not to fix the wardrobe in the main bedroom as he feels that this is not a safety concern, which just boggles my mind. The damaged light switch has not been fixed to date. <laughs> I mean, because it's like, you know, the one thing he could have done. Yeah. Just take... <laughs> Except he couldn't have done it because there was a wardrobe in the way. He wouldn't have been able to fit it back in there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. At least kill the circuit to it or something. Yeah, well, yeah, (laughs) that's right. I mean, it's not like we were using that room anymore, except for to store that ladder. We feel that the landlord has generally exercised due diligence. And so this is, again, so here we're explaining kind of, you know, why we stayed in the house, like what, (laughs) and and, uh, Mm -hmm. trying to to be the nice guys, I guess. Mm -hmm. We feel that the landlord has generally exercised due diligence in the past and has been responsive to our previous requests for various minor repairs. Whilst we understand that the landlord may choose not to perform the structural... Whilst... Yeah, that's right. Whilst (laughs) (laughs) we're being formal here, this is legalese, legalese. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Whereas heretofore, (laughs) concordantly, forthwith. (laughs) Whilst we understand that the landlord may choose not to perform the structural repairs due to the cost, we cannot remain in the premises in their present condition due to the safety concerns to our family. Also of note. The landlord is not providing reasonable... Well, this, so this is, this is another thing that I haven't even mentioned. So this guy would mm-hmm. just like ring us. He'd just call up and be like, oh, I'm coming over with this contractor. Like, uh-huh. you know, he'd give us like no notice that he was coming over. Right. In our rental contract, it actually stipulated a certain amount of notice was required, you know, like 24 hours yeah, or something Yeah, it's usually like at least that. 24 hours, sure. Or 18 or unless something it's, like that. I mean, unless it's an emergency, I think they can do that, but... Yeah. I don't know. It sounds like, you know, 10 days later, it wasn't really yeah, an emergency. Well, I mean, response. you know, the thing is, you ask me, this was all an emergency. Right. <laughs> you know? yeah. But like, it should have all been dealt with previously. So. Right. Yeah. So also of note, the landlord is not providing reasonable notice to request access to the property, sometimes only an hour prior to arrival with a tradesperson. Due to the risks associated with the front section of the house, we've been sleeping. <laughs> so here we get into the sob story, right? <laughs> Due to the risk associated with the front section of the house, We've been sleeping in the family room in the rear of the house 
which appears to be appears to be the most stable area. <laughs> this is an unsatisfactory arrangement mm -hmm. and is causing significant stress to our family. Subsequently, we are only using one third of the house for which we are still paying full rent. Mm -hmm. We have not sought compensation or reduction in rent to date. We wish to terminate this agreement simply and amicably, but are aware of our rights as tenants should arbitration be required. <laughs> this is where you uh, show them the gun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. show, show them the gun in the room <laughs> we believe that we have clear grounds for termination for breaching the conditions of the lease agreement under the residential tenancies act 1995 and of course you know we looked all this stuff up you know, uh -huh. like, as we tend to do <laughs> I think I've still got a copy of that act on my uh, drive somewhere and the thing is that, well we'll get into this a bit later I guess about how this different legislation affects the contract and all that but uh, we'll come back to that in a little bit. Mm -hmm. Just finish up this letter. So at this time, we are attaching Form 4 of the Residential Tenancies Act, which is the maintenance request. Notice by tenant to landlord to remedy breach of agreement. Notice of termination as a formality, as the landlord has indicated he will not be pursuing the requirements to structurally fix the house and will not be fixing the wardrobe. We appreciate your assistance with property concerns to date and in this matter. As we stated earlier, we hope that we can terminate the agreement simply and amicably so that we can find a new home in which we feel comfortable and safe. <laughs> As I shot across the bow. Uh -huh. <laughs> we submitted this to the property manager, which, which was like the, you know, the real estate agent, and we had no response from the owner. <laughs> is there supposed to be like a formal response or is there some follow-up that he's supposed to make? Yeah, I, I don't remember exactly the details, but I'm sure there's some sort of time frame, you know, for him to respond. Yeah. I think that essentially his not responding was effectively an acceptance of our termination. Okay. If that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So he didn't, he didn't respond. We tried contacting him multiple times, no responses. We never, we've never heard from the guy again. Like after really? that was it, never heard from the guy again. <laughs> yeah. So everything else after that went through the property manager. Uh huh. Which is just sketchy. Well, I mean, that's why you have a property manager. <laughs> it's just weird because, you know, he was a, up until that point, you know, we got mm -hmm. along with him reasonably well. He, he was a pretty nice guy. Yeah. And he had been trying to do the right thing, you know, uh -huh. I mean, and we acknowledge that, you know, but look, <laughs> I'm not going to have my family living in this death trap just because this guy's a nice guy. You know? Right. <laughs> <laughs> just because he wants to save some money up to renovate it later on or whatever. Yeah, no. So we pretty quickly found a new house. And we moved to the new house on the 26th of October. Mm -hmm. So this was a further three weeks after we had submitted this termination of lease letter. So that's a total of a solid month living in that back room with the right. possums. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the new house, which is the house we're still living in now, was, um, it was slightly higher rent, but it was a bigger house, a better location, a little bit closer to the city, beautiful yard with all its trees. Uh, <laughs> there's a big shed in the back. It's got a nice kind of dog park behind it, so we're much happier here. We've been here for, you know, since then, so what, three years or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that worked out all right. I mean, at the end of the day, we ended up finding a better house mm -hmm. and really a better situation overall. And so our total time living in the house of doom was about five months, so from June to October. <laughs> right, but from when the problem started, it was really only, what, like a month or so? Or... The first thing that fell was in, like, July, Oh, it was yeah. only like a few weeks after we moved in. So, I mean, but yeah, from when the real problem started, it was uh -huh. only like a month. Yeah. Crazy. So one interesting thing that happened while we were in the process of moving was I was telling my, my manager at work the whole story and that we were moving to a new house and all that. And we were just chatting about it. And he says, that house you're living in, is that, is that like an old 50s house? And it's near this big park? And I said, uh, I said, yeah, yeah, it is. <laughs> he goes... <laughs> He goes, oh, because my uh, sister-in-law used to live in a house just like that, right in that area, and it had the exact same problems, like the exact same thing happened to them. All this, this stuff was falling off the ceiling, and oh, and they had to break the lease and everything. Uh -huh. I'm going, really, really? So so we get into it more, and it turns out they were living in the exact same house. <laughs> no they were way. living there. They, they moved out just before we moved in. Uh, like, literally, they moved out like a month before we moved in. <laughs> and so all this stuff had been going on with them. So all this stuff, yeah, all this stuff had been happening. And clearly they had broken their lease because of it. Uh -huh. So, you know, w when we got in there and it had had new paint on the walls and all these kind of new cheap renovations that had been done, uh -huh. it was clearly just patching over the problems, patching <laughs> oh, over the cracks. Geez. So, you know, at that point we're like, okay, this guy's a scammer, you know? He's, yeah. This is, this is not right. Like this guy knew the house had problems. 
he brought us in there, put us in an unsafe situation. You know? uh-huh. like that's just that just doesn't happen, <laughs> right? And but you said, didn't you say he had tried to do some foundation work or something, or even this other rental was after that work? I'm not sure. Yeah, at this point, we didn't really know all the details, so right, we just kind of assumed that he had done some. Well, obviously, he had done the renovations, patched up the cracks in the walls and stuff, but we think that the underpinning that he had done had happened after they left. So again, like it's this sort of thing where it's like, well, okay, yeah, maybe he tried to do the right thing. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but, but the thing is, is that as soon as any problem, like as soon as that first cornice fell after that, he should have notified us. Oh yeah. He should have let us know what was going on, what the issues were. Right. You know, I mean, that's just negligent. Oh yeah. No. So, yeah. And I actually talked to her just to try to understand like what their experience was and, uh-huh. and, and try to get more of the story, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. What they did is I think as soon as the first cornice fell, they actually left the house, moved to a hotel, stopped paying rent. And huh. uh, so, you know, kind of like you were saying, we should have done, which is, you know, maybe <laughs> we should have. And then they went to the tenancy tribunal and got some money back. What's that? Tenancy tribunal is basically an arbitration service that's provided by the state. Okay. So understanding what their experience was with this tenancy tribunal, we decided that it was a worthwhile effort for us to try to do to see if we could get any money back based on the fact that at this point, we just, we weren't going to be nice to this guy. Right. Know? So beyond just breaking the lease and I guess getting your security deposit back, you were going to see if you could get even more money back for it. Is that right? Basically what we wanted to get back was some of the rent that we had paid. Cause remember we were still paying full rent sure. for that whole time that we were living, even after we had filed that termination of lease letter Uh you know we still paid full rent for that following month Mm -hmm. and we were only using a third of the house so basically we wanted to get back i can't remember how how we worked it out but kind of two-thirds of the rent that we had paid or something like that Mm -hmm. and we also tried to get back some money for like moving expenses and some of that kind of stuff but i'll get to that in a minute yeah so we, we put in for this tenancies tribunal thing and now we had actually had a previous experience with this I mentioned earlier that my wife had owned this uh, rental unit for about 10 years that we had sold when we first moved out to Australia. And we sold that in order to have a down payment for the the first house that we bought up in the hills. Mm -hmm. During that process, there was a tenant living in the place at the time who had been there for several years. I think she was sort of like a a widower in her 50s or something like that. A widow? Widower? Widow. Widow. A widow. (laughs) And so in order to sell that place, obviously, we had to get her out of there. I don't remember what the terms of her lease were or or when it would expire, but we basically sent her some letters saying that we wanted to terminate the lease. Mm -hmm. We sent several letters. We had our property manager at the time actually take her around to look at new properties, like (laughs) like a new place that she could rent Uh because our property manager was eager to get her out of there so she could sell the place and get the commission on on the sale, you know? Basically what happened was this woman just didn't want to leave, (laughs) you know? Yeah. So... Try to turf her out and she wouldn't take it. <laughs> so we ended up, I can't remember if we took her to the tenancy tribunal or she took us to it or whatever, but uh-huh. uh, we ended up at the tenancy tribunal with her. Again, it's, it's basically just an arbitration process. Uh-huh. You sit in front of effectively a judge yeah. and you sort of both explain, you know, it's basically Judge Judy. <laughs> do the judges in Australia wear the big white wigs like they do in, uh, in England? <laughs> they do, but uh, I don't think they were wearing it for this thing. I, I didn't yeah. go to that first hearing for that property. And our experience, I'll get into our experience a little bit later, was, was a little bit different. So I don't know if it was in like a formal courtroom, if they would have had the white wigs and stuff. I tell you what, if I ever end up in court, <laughs> like in Australia, I'm just I'm not going to be able to hold it in. <laughs> You'd be able to just look ridiculous. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> it's, it's literally it's, a kangaroo court. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I'm sure that'll work in my favor. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, but and what happened in this hearing was uh, the tenant basically played dumb. She's like, "Oh no, no, I never got any letters." She's like, "No, no, they never notified me. They just, they just kicked me out of the place." It's like, <laughs> like, yeah, we thought she was just this kind of nice old lady. It's like, what? You liar! You're just a horrible <laughs> person. You know. <laughs> So she just outright lied. Well, what about, the, I mean, don't you have like, do you do like certified mail or anything like that with these letters? I mean, wouldn't you? Yeah. I mean, it was all done very formally and all that stuff. And, you know, it was all delivered. But what can you do? She, oh, well, I didn't get it. So right, But if you had like certified mail, don't you have at least a receipt that you sent this stuff? And I don't, I don't know, know what the deal was, but <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> all I know is that the property manager sent. Since... Sounds like you screwed it up. Yeah. Well, blame it on the property manager. That's why you have a property manager. Yeah, but uh, yeah, so so we ended up, we basically ended up losing that and we had to wait. I think the outcome was that we had to wait until the lease term was up or we had to pay her some money or something like that. I don't remember what it was, but it was a real pain in the ass. Uh-huh. And it cost us a lot of money too because we were 
after she moved out, we had to renovate this place a bit so that we could sell it because it was a bit dated. Uh huh. And at the time, we had already bought this house in the hills. So uh-huh. we had what was called a bridging loan, <laughs> which meant that essentially the bridging loan is a higher interest rate than your normal loan. Uh huh. So we were paying this, we were paying this sort of high interest rate on this property, which we weren't getting any rent income for. Mm-hmm. So it was just an expensive. We were very motivated to sell that place at that point. Yeah. Looking back, I don't think I would do the same thing again. I mean, it's at this point, I I don't know if I want to buy a house again, but it's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's, not, it's not up to me. <laughs> yeah, no, good luck. <laughs> at least with the current market, <laughs> but uh, but we'll see if prices come down. Then we'll see. Yeah, so that was our first experience with the Tenancies Tribunal. So I was already a little bit dark on it. We weren't really expecting much out of this experience. But if mm-hmm. anything, we were thinking, well, like, at least they're heavily biased towards the renter, right. you know, towards the tenant. <laughs> yeah. So we were hoping that that might work in our favor a little bit. So we went there, and they put us into this, what they call a conciliation room. What this is, is it's basically like you just sit at a table, and the idea is that you try to work out a solution without having to go to a formal hearing. Mm -hmm. It's just an informal process. They kind of give you some time for the two parties to to discuss it on their own. And we were in there, my wife and I were in there with the property manager. Mm -hmm. So there was two representatives from the property manager. For whatever reason, the judge, or I I guess I'll I'll call her the judge, was late getting there. And so we sat there for like a half hour, just like shooting the crap with these property managers. And of course, we got along fine with them. Right. They were nice and everything. Like, Were they sympathetic? I mean, did they understand the issue and the safety concerns? They didn't really even know what had been going on with this whole thing. Like, they, oh, yeah. I don't know. I was surprised because, so this guy, we knew that he had rented this place before. And we actually, we started telling him this whole backstory of this thing too. We said, we said, did you guys know when he hired you as a property manager, did he disclose to you like the history of this house? Uh-huh. And they said, no, no. And we worked out that we were the first renters under them. Under that manager. Yeah, under those managers. So as far as they know, this guy had just bought that house and then <laughs> took them on as a property manager. They had no idea that he had previously rented it. Oh, geez, really? Or that it had had all these problems yeah. previously. So he was basically putting them probably in a position of some sort of liability. I mean, I, I don't know what kind of liability they would have had, but mm-hmm. but if I was them, I would be like, get, you know, we're getting rid of this guy. <laughs> like, this guy's a liability to us. Like, right, yeah, totally. Certainly the property is. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But it was weird. They just seemed like they didn't seem to really care. I don't know. I don't, I don't think they were quite that bright. <laughs> but um, <laughs> Well, yeah, or maybe they just realized they were just in a bad situation, didn't want to... <laughs> Yeah, like, I, I don't know what it was, but they were definitely sympathetic to us as well. And some of the discussions we had had earlier on in emails and stuff where she was saying like, oh, yeah, that's just not good enough. You know, we'll, we'll get this handled quickly, you know. Sure, yeah. Not that they did, but. So the judge finally came in. You know, it was funny. So at this point, it sort of turned into a, a bit more formal, like, because uh-huh. now they're there representing this owner and they've uh-huh. got to sort of defend him after we've just told them how he's been shafting them the whole time, you know, as well right. as us. Was it just you guys or did you have a lawyer or anything or just you guys? No, and no, it was just managers? us. Yeah. It was fairly cut and dry, like like what the whole thing was all about, really. Plus you were using words like whilst and heretofore. That's right. We had the lingo. Yeah. <laughs> We figured that whoever used the most haughty language would win. (laughs) (laughs) That way at least they thought you were lawyers. So the judge came in and sat down and basically we just each gave our side of the story or or really, I think it was really more like we kind of said our our side of the story and then they every now and then would come back with, oh, well, but this and this and this and, you know, try to kind of defend, I guess, the owner's position. You know, well, he did do this and he did try to do this and da, da, da. I mean, nobody was challenging that we had the right to terminate. Uh Like that wasn't the issue. Right. This whole thing was about, can we get compensation for some of this rent that we've paid? Right. That's really all it was for. It was for us to try to claw back a meager amount of the rent that we've paid. (laughs) Long story short, the outcome was that the judge suggested that our bond and half of our requested compensation was a fair settlement. Okay. Now, in this case, that half turned out to be something like 700 bucks or something like that. It doesn't sound like a lot. We had only requested like 1400 or something like that. And that included stuff like moving expenses and... Uh We even put in there like the the tenancies tribunal application fee. <laughs> we <laughs> had to be compensated for that. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> and, and some of this other stuff, like, you know, we were trying to nickel and dime it a little bit. Right. And we had provided them this whole breakdown. So, you know, the judge basically came in and said, no, all that stuff down there, that's you're not getting that. <laughs> like, uh-huh. That's just stupid. <laughs> well, I guess in the terms of the rent compensation, uh, they did give us a reasonable amount of what we requested. So uh-huh. it was one of those things where we kind of walked out going, well... I guess the way those things work, I haven't been involved in too many sort of arbitrations like that, but I suppose if it's in a position where both parties are kind of like, eh, okay, <laughs> not feeling good, not feeling bad, right. then it's probably a, 
a fair settlement. You right. know? <laughs> <laughs> I've talked to architects who have been involved in some kind of, at least in the U.S., there are three kind of levels you can go to to arbitrate a claim. The first is mediation, which it sounds like this was, which is supposed to just be a voluntary thing, you know, where both parties get into a room yeah. and there is a, a mediator. They talk it out. Yep. The mediator kind of says, okay, you pay half, you pay half. And they both leave. You know? That's exactly what this was. Pretty yeah. Much. And then beyond that, there, there's arbitration, which is a... Um, it's a more formal hearing sort of thing. Yeah. I'm right? just trying to think if it's actually legally binding. Well, it would um, be legally binding under the contract because the contract would typically stipulate that, yeah. you know, both parties agree to to any decision rendered by a mutually agreed arbitrator or something like that. Right. So mediation and arbitration um, has a little more teeth behind it. And then, of course, yeah. there's litigation, which is where you're you know, in a court, there's yeah. discovery of all of this information, and it's a whole process. Right. Yeah, yeah. And so this decision by this judge didn't actually have any enforcement behind it. It was basically just her suggestion. And essentially, it's kind of saying, well, if you bring it to a hearing... This is what I'm going to judge it anyways, you know. So she's kind of telling you what the outcome's going to be anyways. At that point, it doesn't really make sense for either party to try to pursue it any further because it's pretty clear what the outcome's going to be. Yeah, it's going to cost a lot more than 700 bucks to hire lawyers and <laughs> all that stuff. Yeah, that's right. So in that sense, this conciliation process was pretty beneficial to both parties, I think. Mm -hmm. and, and it also saved the judge, you know, it took her maybe a half hour of her time as opposed to some long drawn out hearing or whatever. Right. So what ended up happening was that the owner offered us the amount suggested by the judge and we accepted, uh -huh. which was pretty much to be expected. Yeah. But again, it's only he wrote us a letter. It came through some formal channels uh -huh. through the property manager or whatever, you know, so uh -huh. this guy, I mean, I just, <laughs> yeah, he's probably out of the country at that point. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny. So since then what's happened is he did actually tear the house down pretty soon after we left. Uh huh. And now that has been three years, he actually has built a new house there. Of course, I don't know if he sold it and somebody else built the house or whatever, but because uh -huh. he was planning on doing these separate units, but it looks to me like it's just a single house, single family house that's been built there. Maybe he just wanted to build something and sell it and get rid of the property rather than <laughs> keep going through this, these rental nightmares. Yeah, because this whole thing was that he was trying to save up money, enough money to like do a proper renovation, not a renovation, but a proper uh, construction of this new apartment complex or whatever that he wanted to build on this single family lot. Mm -hmm. One funny thing that came out of this too was that the, uh, the gas company we were buying our gas from, they screwed up our address and they, for some reason they kept sending our bills to that same house. Uh -huh. And of course the best thing about that was that it, after a little while there was no mailbox at that house. There was no house there. <laughs> These idiots <laughs> are still sending our bills to that house. Like God knows where they were ending up. <laughs> I think we finally got that resolved like, you know, six months later or something. I don't know how they managed to screw it up that badly. After all of this, did you ever find out why the house was collapsing in the way it was? We never found out definitively, but we do have, I think, a pretty good theory of what happened. I mean, you've got to understand that this house was built in like the, I don't know, 40s or 50s or something like that. Mm -hmm. And so... Something must have changed recently that caused this thing to fall down. It's been standing for 50 or 60 years, so it doesn't really make sense that it would just start crumbling like that all of a sudden. Right. We got a little bit of insight from our next door neighbor, which was an older couple who had been living there for quite a while. And they give us a little bit of a history of the kind of ownership of the house. And apparently there was one family that had been living there pretty much since it was built. I'm not sure if they were the ones that actually built it or whatever, but, but there was one family that had lived there for a long time. And then, of course, the kids had grown up and moved out and everything. And eventually, I think it was the whatever mother, grandmother, or whatever of the family passed away. And the house was left to the kids who are now adults. Two or three of the kids actually moved in for a little while and were living there. Mm -hmm. It sounds like they didn't really take care of the place. They didn't have a lot of respect for it, which is kind of sad given that it was like, you know, their family house that they grew up in, apparently. Mm -hmm. I think they had the idea that they wanted to sell it off for development or whatever. They probably understood that it was an old house and would have been pretty expensive to renovate. So they were probably hoping to unload it onto someone else who could develop the land. Mm -hmm. My understanding is that these people who had inherited the house were the ones who cut down, I think we've mentioned there were these two big trees in the backyard. Uh -huh. And our understanding is that they had those trees cut down. And I think that they did it without a permit. I think in most places you need to have some sort of a permit to cut down what's called a significant tree, which in Adelaide, that means it's got to be a certain 
diameter or a certain circumference around the trunk or something like that means it's a significant tree okay and these these things were huge you know they were like probably a meter in diameter (laughs) which is like a yard in diameter for you bloody yanks (laughs) (laughs) so they were definitely significant trees but it sounds like they hadn't actually gotten a proper permit to cut them down for whatever that's worth how dare they well the thing is you, you wonder well who is it that actually cut them down then because you'd think that any established arborist is going to be pretty aware that if they cut down some trees that hasn't got a permit, that they can probably be in some sort of trouble. So I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's a tree cutter who was also selling them solar panels. He's a black market arborist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know a guy. Is that a big gum tree? Yeah, I know a guy. <laughs> <laughs> There's a construction company around here called Stealth Construction. <laughs> and I always imagine them like, you know, in the middle of the night, they just like appear in your yard and build a shed or something <laughs> and <they> disappear. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, so these guys cut down those two trees in the back. And then I think shortly after that, they sold the place to, I believe, directly to the guy who was our landlord. We actually managed to find an old real estate listing for when this house was actually for sale. Hmm. And there was this massive tree in the front yard. Like it it was, you couldn't even see the house. This thing was just covering like the whole front yard. (laughs) And I think I mentioned before, there was like a dead patch in the front yard where this tree had been and they had ground up the stump and everything. Right. But we didn't kind of realize how huge this thing was until we got online and and found this listing. Hmm. I'm not sure what kind of tree it was, but it was definitely a significant tree as well. And so we think that our landlord was the one who cut down that tree in the front yard. Mm-hmm. I think we mentioned earlier that the soil here is very, it's basically just clay. In Adelaide, what happens is the soil just gets saturated in the wintertime and then just dries out and turns to concrete in the summertime. And that's just what happens every year. Mm-hmm. So I think what happened was that because these trees were cut down, it changed the way that water was retained in the soil. And so instead of having these massive trees sucking up all this extra water, and probably keeping the soil a bit drier than it would have been otherwise. There was more water being stored in the soil and softening up the soil. And I think that's what caused the sudden change in circumstances. Well, not only that, but I would think that, depending on how long it had been since they cut the tree down, that eventually that root system is going to start to decompose. And so the pressure of the soil around it is going to allow that soil to move and start to take over the space where the tree used to be. Yeah, and and it kind of makes sense because if you remember the way that the house was moving, it seemed like the the whole kind of front wall of the house was just leaning out or or kind of sinking down or something like that and was kind of pulling away from the rest of the house. Mm -hmm. And that makes sense. So if you've got some sort of root subsidence there or even if the soil's just getting softer because it's got more water in it, that that would happen, especially, you know, right where that big tree was. Right. The other two trees in the backyard, I think they probably had less of an effect on this whole thing because they were kind of way out in the back of the yard Mm -hmm. and their root systems wouldn't have been, you know, they might've come kind of halfway to where the house was. So I don't think those two trees would have had as much of an effect here. Although the neighbor who I mentioned that was telling us the history of this place at the same time that our house was having the problems with the, you know, house falling down and all that, he had a retaining wall between his yard and our yard. Uh And that retaining wall started just same kind of thing. I think it was leaning in towards our yard and kind of falling apart and all that. So he had to have that (laughs) retaining wall rebuilt while we were there as well. Yeah. And so once we understood what was going on, it made sense that probably because they chopped down all these trees, it just really messed up what the soil was doing. So where you have this house with separate concrete piers anchoring it in place, if those individual piers start moving around, There's nothing else that's going to really hold the house together at that point. And so that's where the solution of trying to make the house more rigid up in the attic space, I guess, could have helped with that. Or at least that would have kept the whole house moving as a unit rather than having the front and the back (laughs) moving separately from each other. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I think that might have been a bit of a stopgap. If they did a good job with it, I think they could have made it last a little bit longer (laughs) and patched up all the cracks and all that stuff. Yeah. But who knows? It could have been another three months, another six months, another 12 months before this thing finally caved in. It's hard to say. Right. All we knew was that we weren't going to be sticking around that place any longer. (laughs) When we walk through the door of a building, how do we know if that building is safe? I think a lot of people probably put a lot of faith and trust in government processes that are put in place to attempt to provide some guarantee of safety when buildings are constructed. 
Of course, examples of this are requiring buildings to be designed according to official building codes, having government building inspectors review the construction periodically and sign off on the final building, requiring licensing for architects, engineers, contractors, and other professionals who are involved with the design and construction of the building project, and periodic inspection of constructed buildings after they are occupied. Each of these different approaches we could probably address in their own episode, and we probably will address in the future on this podcast. So keep listening. (laughs) That's what you have to look forward to. (laughs) (laughs) Right. So I'd like to have a look at how these government approaches to providing safe buildings played a role in this case, or maybe how they failed in this case. The first three all relate to the original construction of the building. So these were compliance with building codes, licensing of architects and engineers, as well as building inspections during construction. Now, obviously, this house was built back in the 50s or something like that. So there's a good chance that the building codes that existed back then were quite different than they are today. My guess is, knowing the way that Australia tends to go, is that they were much more lenient in those days than they are now. Yeah, and that's true everywhere. I mean, building codes generally tend to get more restrictive over time. Although there are some cases in which they actually become less restrictive or at least become more nuanced in some areas where they might start with a broad restriction on some aspect of the building, but then narrow that down to certain use types or certain construction applications where it's really most relevant. In this case, it's hard to say that building codes weren't applied or enforced or anything during the construction. I mean, obviously the house did stand for 50 or 60 years or something like that without significant problems. So something must have been done right early on. However, the fact that it was done right early on didn't really help us. You know, the house still fell down. So I guess the question is, if all this emphasis is placed on safety when a building is built, how do you know that the building remains safe throughout its life? And how do you even know what the real lifespan of the building is? Yeah, 50 years is a relatively long life expectancy for a building. Not that any building couldn't be maintained for more than 50 years, but generally when you get to that point, you're getting into some pretty significant maintenance costs. Yeah, like reframing the, up in the attic. Or, or even just renovating the building just to keep it up with modern uh, conveniences, like toilets in the house. Yeah, toilets in the house and kitchens in the house. And remember that this house was renovated at least once or twice. Again, we think they had the addition done in the back, maybe in the 80s or something like that, based on the decor of that area. And then there was some minor renovations done just before we moved in, which was probably more just to patch up the cracks and hide everything Mm -hmm. than it was to actually shore up anything. (laughs) The way that works with building codes is depending on the extents of renovations, you could be required to do more or less evaluation on the existing structure and possibly even bring it up to current building code standards by going in and providing some additional reinforcing or, you know, maybe new foundations, as you said. New light switches, new wardrobes. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> right. Gotta get some structural steel light switches to support those loads. <laughs> right. <laughs> so over time, as older buildings are renovated, those often become opportunities to fix any problems that have developed over time with the existing structure and possibly enhance the existing structure consistent with current building codes. I would imagine that in this case, especially with the more recent renovations, that they weren't significant enough to require any new applications or inspections or anything like that. Mm -hmm. But again, I mean, they they had this engineer guy come in. I think what happened here was a little bit of a black swan as well, because really the house itself was built pretty soundly. It's just that the ground underneath it was uh, no longer as sound as it used to be. Mm -hmm. Looking back on it, we've kind of got this holistic view of everything that went on and everything that happened that led up to this. So I think we've been able to piece together what happened with these trees and everything. But I would imagine that going into it, this landlord guy doing these renovations or whatever he was doing wouldn't have understood what was going to happen just based on the fact that these trees had been cut down. You would think that there's someone, you know, at least this underpinner guy that would have had some clue about that. But again, you know, he might have come in, there's no tree there. He doesn't know there was a huge tree in the front yard. Mm -hmm. So I, I think there's probably a lot of a lot of things that happened in this that were probably a bit of mis- miscommunication and just lack of knowledge. Or lack of professional curiosity. <laughs> yeah, well, there's that too. <laughs> you know, a lot of times contractors will, you know, if somebody's coming to underpin a house for that reason in that area, you're right, this is kind of a unique event that this happened at this house based on what was going on in the soil. 
Yeah. But I bet that guy coming in and doing the underpinning has probably seen it 20 times in that area, you know? Yeah, that's right. Because the people who are calling him are the people who have had the same problem <laughs> on their property. Maybe it wasn't a tree that got cut down, but at least there's something happening in the soils underground. Yeah. And you'd think that those guys would be pretty attuned to that because they need to understand what's happening in the soils in order to do their work. Yeah, and so another thing is, of course, we mentioned that I think all of these three trees were cut down without whatever permits or whatever you're supposed to have to cut down trees like that. Now, I don't know that these permits are intended for maintaining the soil consistency or anything like that. I think they have more to do with, you know, preserving historical trees and keeping the neighborhood looking the same as it always has and that sort of thing. Right. When you go to cut down a tree and your neighbor starts screaming about it or whatever, oh, I like looking at that tree in your yard, you know, that drops branches on your house and all that stuff. Mm Mm-hmm. That's probably what most people have in mind when they think about getting these permits to have trees cut down. I don't know what it takes to get one of these permits, but I wonder if there's any sort of investigation that goes on into what's this going to do to the soil. I would think that the guy taking the tree down would hopefully advise the property owner of that kind of risk, especially with a tree that big. Right. We had a small tree taken out in our yard when we put a patio in, and our contractor was really worried about it. Well, he was more worried about it growing back, but he also, we did talk about the fact that it could start to undermine the soil and affect the foundation of our house. Right, and have some root subsidence and that sort of thing. Right, I mean, this isn't a big mystery for these guys who, who take <laughs> these trees out. I mean, They're licensed, right? Who knows? The last approach I had mentioned that government could take is periodic inspections of occupied buildings. And this is something that happens on commercial properties depending on the jurisdiction, you know, maybe once a year or so, the fire department or building inspector will want to come through an occupied building and check the fire alarm system, check the smoke detectors, make sure that everything's working properly. And it's not that they're requiring people to upgrade to current codes. Generally, once you build something to code requirements, you're grandfathered into those code requirements until you do some major renovation. But for residential properties, I don't think there are too many jurisdictions where state building officials are coming through occupied houses to check them for maintenance issues. And I'm not necessarily saying that they should. As we'll talk about in another episode, I would question the value of state building inspectors to begin with. But the point being here that the government really didn't have any safeguards in place that would have prevented this from happening or would have provided any kind of guarantee to Joe that the house he was moving into was going to be safe and sound. Given that, especially for an older house, there really isn't any sort of guarantee that the government can give you that you're moving into a safe house. We'd like to have a look at some lessons learned from this experience and look at some actions that you as an individual can take to protect yourself in these sort of situations. So we'll look at this from really both sides of the equation, both as a tenant or a, or a house purchaser or as a landlord or a house seller, and look at some actions you can take to protect yourself. Now, some of these, I think, might seem a little bit over the top or outlandish, but I guess we just want to kind of lay them out there and you know, let you decide for yourself what's really worthwhile. That's true of a lot of the kind of anarchic solutions that we're talking about in a lot of these episodes. So we've come up with about 10 items here for either the tenant or a buyer, basically the person who's going to be moving into the house. Now, the first one is really more of just an attitude thing, just to understand that when you're moving into the house, it's your life. You need to be responsible for it. On a less dramatic note, you will be the one to suffer any inconvenience caused by any problem that arises in the house. In the current house that I'm renting, we've just had an issue where there was a leak in the wall behind one of the bathrooms. And it caused some damp and some mold and and that sort of stuff. So we've, over the last two or three weeks, we've had contractors in and out of the place to patch up the pipe and redo the tiles. And we're still waiting. They have to come back and redo some of the plaster on the wall. Since we're living here, we've got to accommodate these guys and we've got to be around when they can come around. And so we don't have to pay for the actual renovations, but it is a hassle for us and it, it is quite an inconvenience. So the first thing that you can do to give yourself a better sense of security is to educate yourself at least a little bit about maybe what the building codes are, what best practices are for house construction, what some of the sort of key pitfalls are for people either renting or buying a house, what are the common problems that can arise. I suggest maybe you watch the movie The Money Pit. (laughs) It's a great educational uh, documentary. Documentary, right. (laughs) (laughs) Two weeks. Now, that being said, even if you've studied up engineering and architecture and all this stuff, as we have, we are, of course, experts in these fields, 
you still can't foresee every contingency that occurs. I mean, like we were just saying just a bit earlier, there's probably very few people that would have picked up on the consequences of cutting down these trees and all the knock-on effects that that would have had. And especially you as a tenant moving in, that's something that's probably a bit more obscure that you're not going to be aware of. Although now that you've listened to the Ann Architecture podcast, episode five, you'll know. (laughs) And another sort of corollary to this is that you can know your rights under the law, but that law has limited effectiveness, especially in the short term. So in our case, we knew that we had the right to cancel the contract, get out of the house and recoup our bond and all that, as well as to recoup some of the uh, rent that we had paid. However, none of that happened until two months after we had moved out of this place and had moved into this other place. So you can get the law involved, but first of all, I don't know who we could have even called to ensure that anything would have happened more quickly on this thing. We did have some discussions with some sort of housing ombudsman or someone like that (laughs) to try to at least get some advice as to what we could do in this situation. Quite frankly, we ended up where we did. So I think that if you're relying on the state to sort of back you up in a situation like this, you can take that chance, but you better have a plan B and be able to take some action on your own so that you can rectify the situation more quickly. Right. As you said, you didn't even really go through a full legal process. It was more of a mediation process. If you actually had to go through a litigation through the state, it wouldn't have been worth it. And that's what happens with these governmental legal systems is that they're just inaccessible to common people with common problems. Right. Okay. So to sum that up, lesson number one is to educate yourself and uh, just become a bit more knowledgeable about the risks involved in living in a house. (laughs) The second thing you can do when you're moving into a rental is to ask the landlord for the most recent home inspection results. Chances are, whenever they bought the property, they would have had a home inspection done. And if any problems were identified in that report, then you can go through and either walk through the house or discuss it with the landlord and just determine if anything there has been addressed or if there are any glaring problems that are going to be real safety concerns that you might not be able to observe readily. Right. And in this case, I wonder whether this guy actually had a house inspection done. I'm, I'm thinking that he probably didn't, and that's because he was intending to tear down the house anyways and do some sort of construction, you know, rebuild on that property. Mm-hmm. So my guess is that he never had a house inspection done in the first place. But, you know, again, if we had asked while we were applying for the rental, then at least we would have been aware of that and that there was a bit of an uncertainty there, you know, knowing that it was an old house right. and, you know, hadn't been inspected in a while. If we were really concerned, we could have even paid to have a private house inspector go and inspect it just for us, for our sake. Sure. I think those do tend to run something like, I don't know, 2000 3000 bucks. Oh, That's really? About right. They're cheaper than that over here. They may be like 500 bucks. Uh, okay. Or maybe it's like 1500 I don't know, but yeah. Whatever it is in the U.S., just double or triple it, and that'll be pretty close to what it is in Australia. Hmm. That's pretty much goes for anything. Hmm. So the third action you can take is similar to this. You could request the past five years renovation or repair history. This is kind of like what you might do if you buy a used car, where you want to know, you know, has it been maintained? Has it been in any accidents or anything like that? I think there are even some registries for cars that you can go on and find out if they've been in accidents and all that sort of thing. Yeah, it's like Carfax. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, we do all of these things when we buy cars, but when we move into a house, we have much less information about the safety and maintenance of the house that we're either buying or or renting. Right. And any problems that arise in a house could be much more expensive than any problem that you have in a car. I think that one's fairly common sense. And again, had we done that in this situation, they might have told us that they had done this underpinning and a little bit of patch up renovation prior to us moving in. And to be honest, that probably would have assuaged any fears we had. You know, because we would have said, well, look, they may have been this problem in the past, but it looks like they've done something about it and they fixed it up. The fourth thing you can do is really just to talk to your landlord and get to know him or her before signing the lease. Ask him questions about the safety of the house and how well it's been kept up and just find out how forthcoming and proactive he has been about maintaining the property and addressing any safety concerns. You know, one question might be, have you ever had any safety concerns with this property and how have you addressed them? And just to put this in perspective, my current landlord at the house that we moved into after we left the House of Doom is very explicit about his concern for safety in general and our family's safety as tenants in this house. So he's very quick to respond if there's anything raised that could be a potential safety concern. Knowing up front that he is personally concerned about our safety and about the condition of the house gives me a bit more peace of mind that if something is to arise that he would be pretty proactive about dealing with it and rectifying the situation. So number five is to ask the property manager 
if they have a safety policy. This is similar to the previous one where you would ask your landlord. However, a property manager is more likely to be an established business with multiple clients, multiple properties that they're looking after. And so there's a good chance that they should be the ones in the situation who are most on the hook, I guess, to act professionally and ensure that their reputation remains intact. Now, I doubt that most property managers have any sort of formal safety policy or safety management plan or anything like that. But I guess a good question is, well, why not? If they're looking after the house that you're living in, why not put some pressure on them to actually come up with something like that to give you a bit more clarity as to what they'll do in any situation and as to what their attitude is towards handling safety issues. There are a couple of ways that you could put pressure on them to do this, and one is to make the comment yourself as the person who's going to be paying money for their services effectively. But then the other one is that you could pressure the landlord to, again, put pressure on them where they're looking after his property so really, he should have an interest as well in making sure that they're going to do what it takes to maintain a safe property. This is actually something that's a fairly common practice in the construction industry, especially among some of the bigger firms, where they'll require that any of their subcontractors and might even push some requirements onto their customers to ensure that certain safety protocols are met whenever their guys are going to be on site somewhere. And so this is really taking that similar sort of approach and bringing it down to the individual level where, you know, why is your safety important when you're on a job site, but when you come home, you don't take it as seriously? This is something that one term that I've heard thrown around in the industry is raising the game. So effectively, you're taking your good policies and spreading them around the industry and doing what you can to ensure that everyone has policies that are just as good as yours. For number six here, another thing you could ask for is for the landlord to provide a copy of his homeowner's insurance policy and possibly even have him include this as an appendix in the contract. The point here is just to be aware of what is covered by the landlord's policy. Oftentimes, homeowner's insurance policies may exclude things like water damage, and something like that could have a big impact on you if you were, let's say, you're storing things in a basement, although I guess you don't have a basement in Australia to store things in. (laughs) So if your landlord isn't covered, then if something gets damaged, at least you'll know that you're going to have to go after him for compensation for whatever damage was done. And another thing that might happen, I'm not really an expert on insurance, but I would imagine that some policies might actually enumerate or list any pre-existing issues with the house that aren't covered. So for example, if there was some sort of known structural issue, the policy might actually spell that out, that that particular issue isn't covered. Yeah, I think what they might do, I mean, we talked earlier about inspections. A lot of times before a building can be insured, the insurance company will actually send inspectors out to the property. And I don't think this happens as much in residential properties, but it does in commercial properties. And then they will custom tailor the insurance policy to the condition of the building. So again, this just might give you another look into what the history of the house is and what the condition of the house is before you move in. Number seven is something that Tim just alluded to, which is that you might have stuff in the house that could get damaged. And of course, one way you could protect yourself there is to get renter's insurance to cover the property that you have in the house. So this could be your furniture, electronics, clothing, possibly some valuables. And so this is something that would give you a bit more certainty if, for example, a tree fell on your house and smashed your entertainment system or something like that. Now, one thing with a renter's policy, which I think I've got one of those at the moment, is it's a good idea to catalog the valuable stuff that you have in your house. So for example, if you've got some electronics, It's a good idea to record the models and serial numbers and so on, as well as keep the receipts so that you've got proof that you did own those things and that the policy should be covering them. Number eight, one thing you could try to negotiate when you're signing a lease is to ask for a liquidated damages clause. What liquidated damages means is if there's some breach of the contract where, in this case, let's say the landlord isn't maintaining the safety of the house, then any costs that you incur because of that could be reimbursed by the landlord. So for example, let's say that the house starts collapsing around you and you have to move out to a hotel. If you had a liquidated damages clause, then depending on what the conditions for that were and what would trigger it, the landlord could be responsible for, let's say, paying for your hotel bill. And there are a few different ways that you could approach this. If you were concerned about a particular event occurring, such as the walls falling in and the, the light switch is not supporting the wardrobes, then you could maybe spell out specific circumstances under which the liquidated damages would come into effect. You can imagine that most landlords would be pretty reluctant to sign up to something like this because it puts a reasonable amount of risk onto them. However, it's also something that they should be able to control. 
for the most part, just by maintaining the house properly. So you probably have to be a little bit reasonable with this. And depending, I guess, on your negotiating position as well, if you're bidding for this house against 20 other people that want to rent it, then you might not be in a very powerful position to negotiate from. However, if the house has been on the market for a few months and the landlord's losing money every month, then you're probably in a pretty good position if you're the only one showing up at the open house. Yeah, I mean, some of these things we're proposing here, they might be tough to negotiate as you're trying to sign a lease. If you start proposing some of these things and start using words like whereas and and heretofore, <laughs> you see, no, whilst, was it? Whilst. W- whilst. 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 Yeah. <laughs> You know, then that might be a red flag for the landlord that this is <laughs> that you're a lawsuit waiting to happen. So, <laughs> you know, you want to be tactful about how you how you negotiate these things. But you know, it never hurts to ask. And and something like liquidated damages isn't too uncommon, at least in something like a construction contract. I'm not sure how often you could actually get that into a uh, into a tenant landlord agreement. One more thing, just to explain what liquidated damages are, is that. They're not intended to be any sort of a punitive measure. It's not intended that it's some sort of fine on the landlord for not complying with the contract. The idea is that it's, it's only supposed to be enough to make you whole in the event that you've had to incur additional expense because of something that the landlord has done or hasn't done. Number nine is sort of a woulda, coulda, shoulda for me, which is that if I was in the same kind of or a similar situation again where I felt like the landlord needed to take some action and he wasn't doing it, then I think I would be a lot quicker to start withholding rent rather than continuing to pay it on time. Now, the reason we didn't do that this time was because we wanted to be on the right side of the contract and we didn't didn't want to give this guy any grounds later on to not reimburse us or anything like that or, or hold our bond or anything. But in the future, I would make it very clear that if a situation like this wasn't rectified, that I simply just wouldn't be paying rent until it was. You know, Maybe I could even set up an escrow account or something like that just to show him that the money was there and it's his as soon as the problem's fixed. Of course, that's, that's probably going a little overboard. You got to be careful there. If you're just going to stop paying rent, even if you think the landlord has breached the contract, especially for something like a safety concern, you want to make sure that you don't put yourself in a position where where he has grounds to evict you or, or as you said, to keep your security deposit. I guess you'd have to really understand the conditions of the contract and the legal rights that you have as a tenant to understand when it might be appropriate for you to withhold rent and still live in the house. It's one thing if you move out and then withhold rent, but right. if you're planning to stay in the house and not pay rent, you just want to be careful about making sure that, that you're in the right. I think that what would have happened had we stopped paying rent and continued to live in the house, first of all, they would have taken us to the tenancies tribunal or whatever uh, to try to get that rent from us. And now we would have, I think that we would have eventually paid it I don't know. I don't know. (laughs) I'm not really sure. Because again, the idea here is not that I'm not paying the rent. It's just saying, look, I've got the rent here. It's yours, but uh, I'm not handing it over to you until this situation is rectified. It is really sort of a scorched earth position to take. Yeah. And like Tim said, you've got to be pretty confident in your legal position and understand what the probable outcome of any sort of adjudication or mediation process would be. Yeah, because another issue with that is that that's something that could then reflect later on on your credit report or if you go to rent another place and they call the previous landlord and find out that, you know, if the landlord then comes and says you are delinquent on payments, things like that, then right. there could be other knock-on effects there yep. into the future. So it's certainly a possibility, but it's definitely one that you need to think through pretty carefully before you would do this. Possibly the advantage there is that if and when you do get into this for you, I guess, the tenancy tribunal. I don't know what it would be, like small claims court over here or something. Yeah. If you haven't paid the rent, it's probably harder for the landlord to get money from you that you haven't paid than for you to get back money that you have paid. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I think that the outcome of this would have been pretty much the same, where we would have had to pay some of that rent. However, it's sort of a possession is nine-tenths of the law sort of thing, where right. having the money in our hands might have made it harder for the judge or whoever to recommend that that we pay more money than we really needed to. Didn't you say that the judge kind of implied that because you guys had stayed there and were continued to pay rent, that it indicated some... Yeah. What was it? What she said was that because the landlord wasn't able to rent that house out to somebody else during that time, that that's why we were responsible for paying the rent, which is completely ridiculous because obviously, you know, nobody was going to be living in that place. Right. It was more of the issue that you were staying in the house, not that you had been paying the rent. Yeah, so you I could have so. possibly stayed in the house and not pay the rent and then maybe been in a, 
a stronger position, although again, that might have had some other negative effects. Yeah, I mean, it, it's certainly a risk. The other thing is that we could have stopped paying the rent and gone and booked ourselves into a hotel for a while and hoped that we could have gotten some of that money back. But of course, that's really expensive. You know, I mean, hotels aren't cheap. Right. I mean, 100 bucks a night if you're lucky around here. Mm-hmm. And plus, what do you do with all your stuff? You've got to move that out, put it into storage, and then what's going to happen? If the, if he fixes it, then you're going to be moving back in. Right. Yeah, it's, it's a tough situation. But the point is, is that you can get a little bit creative with how you approach things and how you can put pressure on the landlord. So the last note here, number 10, is that if you're really stuck in this place and your options are limited, you don't think you can get out and rent a place easily, or if you just don't want to leave the house and you're hoping to work with a landlord to make it right, you could offer to cover some of the costs of the repair, especially if you see this as a place that you want to stay in over the long term. Um, So rather than going through all the hassle and headache and possibly other expenses of trying to litigate the situation, maybe you can come to a cheaper and more effective solution by working with a landlord to repair the situation. In a way that you might approach that is that maybe you help to pay for the repairs up front, but then he could possibly agree to reduce your rent over the next year or two years. You know, maybe you extend the lease to a two-year lease at the same fixed rate or something like that. Mm. So that over the long term, it might not end up costing you anything, but it gets the landlord the money he needs to make the repair and to justify the repair. Right. And in our case, I think the, I can't remember exactly how much it was going to be to do this framing up in the roof space. I don't think it was any more than like 500. And I want to say it might've even been something like two or 300. Wow. Yeah. It's nothing. <laughs> so, so that's like, you know, maybe I think it was like one week's rent. Really? So like all of this was over like $500. <laughs> you wouldn't do it. It was something. Yeah. It was, it was like really pretty cheap, like to do this. I think part of the landlord's concern was that he just didn't think it was going to work. Yeah, that could be. There was some history with these guys, and it was just a mess. <laughs> but so, you know, in this case, we could have just said, well, look, we'll pay for this framing thing to happen in the roof. And then hopefully that would have actually solved the problem, at least until our lease was up. And then we could have found another place with less hassle. Right. But would you still have gone back in that other room? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we would have been tearing out that wardrobe, too, <laughs> if that was the case. Yeah. And maybe replacing the light switch. So those are our 10 tips for a renter or a buyer to have a better sense of certainty about the house that they're moving into and and ensure their family's safety. So we've got a few points we'd like to cover from the other side, which is if you're either a landlord or someone who's selling a house, just to make sure that, I guess, your experience is better and that you're putting forward a good product for the renter or the buyer who's going to be moving into the house. So the first one is simply to understand that it is a business Even if you're just a mom and pop, you've got the one little condo that you're renting out or whatever. Uh, I personally own a place over in the U.S. uh, where we had lived when I was living there, and we rent that out now. I'm not a professional real estate tycoon or anything like that, but I do try to treat it reasonably professionally and treat my renter as a customer so that I make sure that I'm responsive to his requests, and especially if there's any sort of safety concern or anything like that. I have hired a fairly experienced property manager over there as well, to look after the place for me, since obviously it's not very easy for me to do from the other side of the world. Do they have a safety policy? (laughs) I should ask. (laughs) Uh, Yes, you should. (laughs) So treating it like a business means a few things. One is to make sure that you're aware of all the relevant legislation, building codes, and that sort of thing. Maybe condo rules if you're in a condo development. All that sort of stuff that will affect the tenant who's living in your property. We've had some issues with our tenants where... There's been some specific requirements about how far you can have the uh, barbecue grill from the house when you're barbecuing and that sort of thing. And we just have to make sure that the tenant is aware of all the rules that are in place. And then another thing that's pretty crucial, which I think would have helped in our situation, is to make sure that you maintain sufficient financial resources, and that may include insurances, to deal with any contingencies that may arise. So this means that if something does happen, you don't get stuck in a position where you've got some sort of cash flow issue where you just don't have the money to make the required repairs for another two months or something like that. You've got to have some sort of a nest egg there to ensure that you can make whatever repairs are required. The second thing you can do if you're a landlord is to get a house inspection before buying the place um, or even before selling it or renting it, just to make sure that you're aware of any safety concerns that may exist in the house. Um, and also to understand if, if you're going to need to be investing in something over the next few years to understand what that is so that you can plan out those investments. So, for example, a, an inspector might come in and tell you that the roof is 15 years old, so it needs to be replaced in 5 or 10 years. You can then plan that into your maintenance budget for the house. Yeah, and another advantage of this, especially if you're selling a house, 
is that there's a good chance that the buyer of the house is going to make any offer subject to a house inspection, which means that if there is some issue that you're not aware of, it could really delay the transaction from happening or even have the buyer call it off altogether. So really it offers you some protection that once you do have an offer for the house, that there's a better chance that it'll go through to closing. The third thing that you could do, and this is something that you might do if you're planning to buy a rental property, is to talk to some of the neighbors around to understand the history of the house and see what they know about the people who have lived there and how they've maintained the house and, and whether they've had any issues in the past. As I discussed earlier, once we had spoken with our next-door neighbor, we learned a bit more about the history of the house that may have given us some concern had we been aware of it earlier on, especially once we saw that first cornice fall. We might have understood that there was something bigger happening. And it's a pretty good idea anyways to go and introduce yourself to your potential future neighbors, whether that's as a homeowner and a person who's going to be living there, or as someone who's going to own that property. And maybe in the future, if those neighbors understand who you are and what you're all about, they might help to look after the place for you a little bit and keep an eye on it. The last note here for landlords is simply, don't be a jerk. Like If you know of some problem with your building, for one thing, you should fix it if it's a real safety concern. Or if not, then at least disclose it to the tenants and let them know of any items that have been problems in the past, even if they've been corrected. In Massachusetts, if you rent a house out, you're required to disclose if the house has lead paint or if it has been deleaded. So there are certified inspectors who come in and review the house for lead paint and test it. And then there are contractors who can come in and mitigate that to give you a certificate indicating that not necessarily that it's completely lead free, but that it has been properly mitigated according to current regulations. So that's one case where the state works. <laughs> they got that right. <laughs> Sound like you've been eating lead paint. And so one thing I'd like to do in the future is maybe an episode about the case for renting versus buying. I still think that renting, at least in Australia's current housing market, renting is the right choice. And with this place, I was damn glad that we were renting the place and hadn't bought it. Because if that was the case, then we would have inherited these problems and been on the hook for whatever repairs were required. Not to mention it would have been a lot more difficult for us to get out of that situation and find a new place. When you sell a house, you've got all these closing costs you have to do. You've got to list the place. You've got to fix it up. But when you're renting, all you really have to do is pack up and leave. Despite the challenges that we had in this situation, it was a lot easier and cheaper to get out of the place than it would have been if we had to sell it. And we probably would have struggled to find a buyer because, quite frankly, the place wasn't in great shape. I imagine we would have lost quite a bit of money on the deal, you know, in only a few months after having bought it. Yeah, you would have had to fix it anyways just to have it pass inspection. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Of course, if we had been in that situation, we probably would have had the house inspected ourselves. A lot of people support government because they believe that it's in a unique position to ensure their safety under many circumstances. As my example in the House of Doom shows, this isn't always the case. Really, the scope of power that the government has is quite limited, even to simple things like house inspections and ensuring that houses are structurally sound. As we saw, there was really nothing that the government did do or could have done to ensure the physical safety of this house and of my family living in the house. And even the channels that were available to us which are probably a bit more favorable to tenants than they are in some other places. Again, like in the U.S., it might just be a generic small claims court, where here there's a specific thing called a tenancies tribunal, which is really intended to look after people who are renting. The result of this process was fairly lackluster, and it only happened several months after the fact. So it really did nothing to ensure our safety while we were actually living in the house. And given how long it took... It really didn't put any pressure on the landlord to resolve the situation in a timely manner. Knowing how long that process was going to take, he had a number of months before he had to actually do anything about it, and by then you guys were gone. Knowing that there were laws to protect us as tenants under certain circumstances, this may have put some pressure on the landlord to act in our interest during the course of our rental contract. At the same time, there's no reason that we needed to have a fixed law that's applicable statewide and enforced by the government when we actually had a rental contract between us and the landlord that could have achieved the same thing. If anything, I'd say that the fact that there's all these extra laws that exist outside of the contract make things confusing for everybody so that it's hard for everybody to understand their full responsibilities under that contract and under those laws. If everything was encapsulated within the contract, then I think our position would have been easier because we would have had a much better understanding 
of what actions we could take and what our rights were in that situation. We also could have pointed to specific clauses in the contract and specific responsibilities that the landlord had in order to ensure that he was acting in line with the contract and that he wasn't in breach. Now again, there's always challenges of interpretation and understanding what constitutes a breach or a safety concern or something like that. There's always some subjectivity that happens there. However, I can envision a free market for arbitration services in which there are a lot more arbitrators around who are capable of hearing these sorts of cases and resolving them quickly and fairly. Yeah, and the contract could stipulate that if there's a dispute that it will be arbitrated by a member of XYZ arbitration organization or something like that, so that you have some kind of industry standard for adjudicating these disputes. Yeah, and that's, that's what you'll see in any construction contract, really, is almost that exact clause. In construction contracts, the architect is actually what they call the first decision maker. So any small disputes that come up during the course of construction, the architect has the final say in whether or not, let's say, a change order is legitimate or not. Now, from there, the contractor can then go on and take it to mediation or arbitration or litigation, depending on what the conditions of the contract are. But most of the disputes can be resolved just within the confines of the design and construction team. To broaden this idea out a bit further, it's important to understand that the government has a fairly limited scope of effectiveness that they're able to achieve in any sort of protective services. For example, consumer safety regulations or environmental regulations can only do so much to ensure people's safety. And this can actually cause a false sense of security among people where they don't really know what these regulations are and what the government's actually doing to protect them. But they have this sort of undeserved trust in the government that there's some bureaucrat somewhere who's doing the right thing and pushing all the right buttons and catching all the bad guys or whatever. And if they're thinking that way, then in their mind, that probably relieves them of the responsibility to ensure their own safety and take appropriate precautions that could actually be effective in protecting themselves and their families. That's right. So some of the 10 strategies that we listed today might sound a little bit crazy or over the top to some people, but I think this perception might come from the fact that people do have this sort of false sense of security that they believe the government's looking after them, so they don't need to go out of their way to take these actions or spend money for house inspections or extra insurance or anything like that. Right. It's like, why should I pay for an inspector to come in and look at this house? Doesn't the city have inspectors that come and do that? Yeah. So it's sort of a crowding out effect, I guess, to some extent, where people believe the government's providing a service, and so they don't bother to take steps to provide it themselves. Through the cold South Australian winter of 2012, when leaving the house meant putting on a light windbreaker. Whilst plaster cornices rained down upon my family, and cracks tore asunder the walls, and the very light switches failed to support their loads, the house of doom crumbled around us, and with it, the facade of the state's ability to protect my family crumbled as well.